Welcome to Acera's new employee slash mid-career seminar. In this seminar, we're assuming that you're either new or you're somewhere in your mid-career, hence the name of the seminar. So you're not yet near retirement. And that's a good thing because it means you still have plenty of time to plan for your retirement. So in this seminar, I'm going to tell you all the things that you might want to know about doing that planning. And since you're curious enough to watch this, you probably have some questions. Questions like, what do I need to know about my pension? Do I need to do anything? And if I need to do anything, what do I need to do? Well, I am going to answer all of those questions and more for you during the presentation. <clears throat> and I, I have organized the answers to all your potential questions in the form of this checklist that we're going to go through. So this is uh, what all of the topics that we're going to cover during the presentation. So first off, I'm going to help you understand some basics about your retirement, the um, retirement that you are earning um, as an ACERA member. <clears throat> we're also going to talk a little bit about pension math. It's not complicated. It's just a multiplication. What this will do is help you understand um, how in to to what degree you are earning retirement. It, it, it helps you understand how you're earning the retirement that you're earning, and it helps you better plan for the retirement that you're going to receive one day. We'll also talk about purchasing service credit uh, while we're on that topic. And there's a, there's a comment. I have noticed that this is not an end of career seminar. Correct. This is a new employee slash mid-career webinar. We're actually doing the pre-retirement seminar live on Thursday. Um, so if you go back out to our seminars page, sarah.org slash seminars, you can, um, you can uh, register for that pre-retirement webinar. That starts at 9 a.m. on Thursday. Alternatively, we also have many past uh, recorded versions of the um, pre-retirement webinar out on our website that you could access today. Uh, feel free to stick around. Because uh, some of the stuff is the same between the two seminars, but we do in that pre-retirement webinar, if you're getting ready to retire, you're probably going to want to, you know, at least watch that because it, it has some things that you're going to need to know in preparing for retirement. Okay, so we're also going to talk about, uh, I'm going to help you get a pension estimate. So get a little picture into your uh, future pension that you're going to receive. We're going to, I'm going to help you understand how you become eligible for your pension. We'll talk a little bit about additional benefits like death benefits and healthcare benefits that you will have available to you. We'll talk about designating your beneficiary or beneficiaries beneficiaries for ACERA death benefits. I'll help you understand some career planning options. And when I say that, I mean like what happens when you leave work here, if you were to leave work before retirement or at retirement. And then we'll talk about making a retirement planning picture. So this is looking into the future and trying to figure out maybe if you need to save a little extra on top of the um, ACERA pension, how to do that and how much to save. And as part of that discussion, we'll talk about starting a 457B account. Um, and we'll talk about us signing up for ACERA News really quickly. Okay, so let's jump right in. Understanding retirement basics. So who is ACERA? Well, in one sense, ACERA is this acronym that stands for the Alameda County Employees Retirement Association. But ACERA is made up of a lot of people. And at ACERA, we have about 90 of us that work here, 90 plus. There might be like 92, 93, 94 of us. Um, what we do, our entire job, is to provide retirement, disability, and death benefits to our members. So that's all of you. You are members of ACERA, so you are also part of ACERA. And you're a member of ACERA because of the position that you work in and who you work for. So you work, or at some point you worked full-time in a retirement eligible position for one of our six participating employers. So these are the six employers that have um, decided that they need to offer pension benefits, retirement benefits to their employees. And so they have an agreement with ACERA where you earn your retirement benefits with ACERA. Um, we are also at ACERA, we are also all county employees. Okay, so we're a public agency that's kind of part of the county, kind of separate from the county. So you work in that full-time or you work full-time in that retirement elig eligible position for one of these employers, and that automatically makes you an ACERA member. And as an ACERA member, you contribute to the retirement system. 
So with every paycheck, a little piece of your paycheck comes out and goes into a Sarah's fund. And here is an illustration of a county pay stub. And if you look at the before tax deductions column, you'll see a line that says retirement, and it will perhaps say your tier in there. We'll talk about tiers in just a minute. And you'll see some money coming out of your current check. And that money is coming out of your check and going into a Sarah's fund. And every time that happens, your employer also makes a contribution on your behalf. So you're paying into a Sarah's fund, your employer is paying in, but we don't want that money just to sit there and collect dust. We want to earn some interest on that money. So what we do is we invest in a broad array of investments all across the world, and we earn quite a bit of interest on that money. And it's three these three sources of income, the employee contributions, the employer contributions, and the um, investment earnings that fund the pension benefits that you're going to receive when you go to retire. So how does that part work? Well, when I say you're earning a retirement and you're going to receive a retirement payment, what I mean is this. While you work, you earn credit toward retirement and you earn credit in three different categories. And I'll show you what those are in just a minute. So you're working, you're earning credit toward retirement, earning more and more and more credit toward retirement the longer you work. Then at some point in the future, you're going to retire. And that, at that point, you're going to stop earning retirement and you're going to start collecting the retirement that you have earned, which will come in the form of a retirement allowance that you will receive every month for the rest of your life. This is also the retirement allowance. There's some other terms for it. Pension, pension benefit, um, retirement benefit retirement allowance, monthly retirement allowance. These are all synonymous terms for the same concept that you're going to get a check and it's really going to be a direct deposit to your um, bank account from a Sarah every month for the rest of your life after you retire. So you cannot outlive your retirement. It happens every month for the rest of your life. That's how a Sarah works. And pensions are special. And let me give you an illustration about why they're special, okay? Because I said that you're paying employee contributions into a SARA throughout your career, right? With every paycheck, okay? That happens during your entire career. Let's say you have a 30-year career. Every single one of those paychecks, a little bit of that paycheck, some of that money is coming out and going into a SARA's fund. When you retire and we start paying you the retirement that you earned, you're going to get all that money back within the first three to five years, and then everything after that first three to five years in retirement is like this amazing bonus that you get for participating in a defined benefit pension plan like a Sarah. And it's not really a bonus because that's just the way it's set up. It's just set up to provide you with a secure retirement that you can count on. So going into retirement, you can do estimates. You can estimate very closely how much you can expect to receive in retirement. And then once you retire, you will receive that every month for the rest of your life. So it's a secure retirement that you are earning. Let me show you some milestones that you will find during your membership with Acera. And let me just uh, let me just check the questions here. Somebody's asking, they'd uh, like to get some tips for maximizing benefits. Um, so we'll definitely talk about maximizing your retirement benefits. Definitely. Okay. So. I'll hang on to that question, and we will definitely get into that. So what you're looking at is a timeline of pension milestones. The first milestone on the timeline is your date of hire. This is the first day that they told you to show up to work. If you got hired right into your full-time retirement eligible position, alternatively, if you started out in some other capacity part-time or like working as a temp or something, this would be the first day that you were in that full-time retirement eligible position. Okay, then two weeks goes by. The first day of your second pay period, that's your date of entry into ASERA. This is the day that you become an ASERA member and you start earning that credit toward retirement and you start paying into the retirement system. So that's true for everybody except people who work for the housing authority and I think Livermore Area Recreation and Parks District. For you all, your date of hire is actually your first day of a CERN membership, okay? So there's not a two-week lag time. Okay, the next milestone is when you become vested in the retirement system. And vesting, it's kind of, it's kind of a loose term. It just kind of means guaranteed, 
Okay, so when you are vested in the system, you're guaranteed the vested benefits. You're guaranteed the guaranteed benefits, basically, which the main one is that retirement allowance that you'll receive every month for the rest of your life. We'll talk a little bit more about vesting in just a minute. Okay, so after you're vested in the retirement system, once you've worked full-time for five years or the equivalent of full-time for five years, there's some date in the future that is going to be unique to you where you become eligible to retire. And it's going to be based on some combination of your years of service and your age. And I'll, and I'll tell you about all the combinations later in the presentation that get you to retirement eligibility. This is the first day that you can physically retire, the day that you become eligible to retire. Um, the retirement eligibility requirements are actually pretty low. They're pretty reasonable. So we'll talk about that later. You could retire on this day, or like many people do, you can keep working and you can earn more and more credit toward retirement. So there's going to be some date after your retirement eligible where you actually physically retire. And this is going to be a date that you choose when you're ready. This is when you stop earning credit toward retirement and you start collecting that lifetime monthly retirement allowance every month for the rest of your life. Okay. Now, uh, I skipped a date here. Actually, this date right here, because these are usually two consecutive dates, this is the day that you terminate employment, the date that you leave, and then your retirement date is the your first day of retirement. If you go straight from active work into retirement, these will be two consecutive dates. Like your termination date will be on a Friday, your retirement date will be on a Saturday. That means you're going right into retirement. Now, um, some people don't do that. Sometimes there's a gap between when you quit and then you retire later, and that's perfectly fine. People do it all the time. And there's actually a question up in the Q&A, what happens if we leave before hitting the five-year mark? Um, I'll talk about that later on in the presentation. What happens if you leave and you don't retire yet? I'll talk about that later in the presentation in the second half. Um, so we, we will get to that. Okay, now, so you have your retirement date you're gonna start receiving that retirement allowance every month. And that's gonna continue until your death. That's when your retirement payments stop. And then there's another milestone on the chart here. Depending on the um, retirement allowance option you choose at the time of your retirement, at, during this time on your retirement application, uh, in many cases, you can name a beneficiary for a continuance and that person can receive continuing payments after your death, known as a continuance that could continue every month for the rest of their life. And then when your beneficiary dies, that's when all of the benefits stop from a Sarah. Okay, let me address the tap question in just a minute. Okay, so a quick word about vesting. I said it occurs with five years of service credit. That also includes um, if you have reciprocity with another retirement system. I'll talk in detail about reciprocity in the second half of the presentation, but just for right now, what it means is that you used to work somewhere else for another public agency in California, and now you work here and you've linked the two systems together to gain some synergy. And um, one of the synergistic effects is that five years combined of service credit between the two systems would get you over the vesting requirement. So that's why it's saying it, it includes reciprocity. And also the guarantee, I said vesting means guaranteed. The guarantee is by state law. Okay, so this is written in the state law. It can't be changed. So your, your, your uh, benefits are guaranteed. And these are the vested benefits, that monthly retirement benefit for the rest of your life an annual cost of living increase that you would receive in retirement um, to your retirement benefit. So your retirement benefit is going to increase with inflation. And then there's a $1,000 lump sum death benefit that's considered vested. And um, like I was saying earlier, there's some other death benefits that will come with um, your retirement as well. Let me tell you about your tier, because this is something that you definitely need to know about. Um, you all are in one of these tiers, and it's based on your date of entry into ACERA. So I was telling you on the pension, on the pension milestone chart, it's this date right here, your uh, date of entry into ACERA. And the way the miles, the um, these timelines work is if you enter ACERA before the cutoff date for a particular tier, that puts you in the earlier tier. Okay, so first thing you're going to do is find which timeline to look at, because you're just going to look at one of them. If you're a safety member, that means you're a sheriff's deputy or a probation officer. There may be some other sworn officers in there. Um, you typically know that you're a safety member, and you would be looking at this bottom timeline. Everyone else who's not a safety member is a general member. 
So you, you would look at the top timeline, unless you're a general member who works for the housing authority or a general member who works for Livermore Area Recreation and Parks District. And then you look at the timeline for your employer. So the way this works is if you enter to Sarah um, before July 1st, 1983, and you're a general member, for example, that would put you in tier one, okay? Um, there's probably not a lot of tier one people, if any, on this, um, watching this because this is a new employee and mid-career webinar and tier one was a long time ago. Now, if you're in, you're in tier two, if you enter to Sarah July 1st, 1983, all the way up to December 31st, 2012, that puts you in tier two. If you enter to Sarah January 1st, 2013 and beyond, that puts you in tier four. And that is the case for all of the timelines. Now you'll see housing authority has a different cutoff for tier one. LARPD has a tier three, but doesn't have a tier two. And there's a different cutoff. Safety members have a few more tiers. Um, there might be some safety members watching that have gone into tier two C or tier two D. This was a election that you made within your first, first 45 days of your safety membership. For everyone, if you if you're not sure which tier you're in and you don't, you're not sure what your date of entry is, the easiest way to solve this definitively and learn what tier you are in definitively is to log into your account on our website. So you go to acera.org, you click the login button in the upper right corner, and then you log into your account. And if you've never done that, it'll take you a minute to create an account. And then once you get in there, you'll see all of your pension data waiting there for you. Okay, I'm going to show you this slide right now. This is like a little preview to give context to the broader discussion that we're having. Okay, and then we'll revisit this concept later on. Um, because this is a new employee and mid-career webinar, what I want to do is like help you plan for the future, help you plan for retirement, which is probably going to be a little ways away. When you go to retire, you're going to stop receiving income from your employer because you're not going to be working there anymore. So you're going to need money to pay for your life. And the three items that you see here in this equation are going to be the three categories of items that are, are income that you're going to use to pay for your life. The Sarah monthly pension that you're earning, Social Security that you're earning uh, in terms of Social Security credit with the federal government. And then anything beyond that is your own personal savings and investments. And so when we add all those sources of income up, what financial planners will tell you is that Whatever you were making before you retire, you're going to need 70 to 80% of that income to maintain your standard of living in retirement, okay? Now, that can seem kind of scary, especially if you're a new employee, like how the heck am I going to get to that amount of income replacement? Just take a breath. It's, it's actually not that complicated. And uh, what we'll do for the first big portion of the presentation, we'll talk about the ACERA monthly pension and how we calculate that. And that's going to make up a big portion of your income in retirement, um, usually. So security will be another good chunk. And then we'll talk about how to determine how much extra to save if you may want to or need to save extra. And it's, you know, it's actually pretty simple math. There's a lot of technology that will help you arrive at these numbers. And it's actually a pretty easy process. So let me um, talk about the ACERA monthly pension first, and then we'll revisit this concept of saving additional toward retirement. So let me help you understand some pension math. And let me let me check the question board real fast. Okay, question is, if you're a general member and you move to safety, does your safety date remain with your original date or the date you start with safety? Your um, entry date is your original general member date. Okay, that's when you start earning service credit. And in fact, you kind of have a split tier. You earned some credit as a general member. So... Um, we're, we're looking, we're keeping track of how much you earned as a general member. Then you moved over to your safety membership and you stop earning general service credit and you start earning safety service credit. And we'll actually do two equations for you. And this is going to be the equation. When you go to retire one for your general membership, one for your safety membership, they'll give you a, um, a monthly retirement allowance amount for each portion of your membership. And then what we'll do is we'll combine the $2 amounts and send you one check. So that's how that's going to work. Seventy to eighty percent of your gross salary, not net, okay, when we're talking about the income replacement. So let me give you some pension math here. What you're looking at is the retirement formula 
that Sarah is going to use when you go to retire. And the reason I'm showing you this now, even though you're probably brand new or you're in your mid career, so you you know you don't necessarily need to learn about this yet. You may think is because if you know how you how we are determining your retirement allowance, it will help you maximize what that retirement allowance is. And when I said earlier that you're earning credit toward retirement in three categories, these are the three categories. The age factor percentage increases um, the long the older you are when you retire, you get a higher and higher age factor percentage. The more service credit, the, the longer you work, the um, more service credit you earn, and it's measured in years. And the longer you work, you usually earn higher and higher salaries through raises and cost of living increases. Um, so that's how you're, you're earning credit in these three categories. Now, let me kind of break down this equation for you. When you go to retire, what you are going to receive as your retirement allowance or pension benefit or pension, whatever you want to call it, is you will get a percentage of your highest salary that you earned at any point in your career. You're going to get a percentage of that highest salary for each year of service. So this English sentence is telling you what this math equation is doing. Let me give you some numbers and it will help you understand it better. Okay, let's say, just for the sake of an example, that the percentage of your highest salary that you will get for each year of service that you work, that you earn in ASERA, let's say that percentage is going to be 2% of your highest salary. And let's say that you work for 20 years full time and you earn 20 years of service credit. Or maybe you work um, 19 years full-time and two years half-time. Well, that would be the equivalent of 20 full-time years of service credit. Okay. So the percentage of your highest salary that you're going to get for each year of service is 2%. And you're going to get 2% of your highest salary for each one of these 20 years. That means that when we multiply these two together, you're going to get 40% of your highest average monthly salary as your monthly retirement allowance for life, okay? Because 2% of your salary for each one of those 20 years is 40% of your salary. Now, let's say that you're, to give you some more numbers and continue the example, let's say that your highest average monthly salary is $5,000. So what we're gonna do is give you as your retirement allowance 40% of $5,000. We multiply them together. 40% of $5,000 is $2,000. So that's how pension math works. Now, the bottom line here is that the higher the age factor percentage, the older you are when you retire, the more years of service credit that you earn, and the highest average, the higher the highest average monthly salary is, the higher any of these three factors are is going to equal a higher and higher monthly retirement allowance. So the main way that you're going to maximize your retirement allowance is maximizing these three numbers. Okay. There's a question, if you have to pick one, which of these factors in the retirement formula increases the monthly retirement the most? Interesting question. I'm not sure of the answer to that. Um, let me think about that and get back to you. So let me tell you about each one of these factors in a little more detail, and that will help you figure out how to maximize each one of these numbers. Okay. So for the age factor percentage, the question is, what percentage of your highest salary will you get for each year of service? Because it's not necessarily going to be 2%. That was just an example. Okay. The percentage that you're going to get is going to be determined by the, your age at retirement. And what you're seeing on this slide is a sample age factor percentage chart to illustrate this point. Now, what you're gonna look for is your tier. So you, if you're a general member, you look at this side. If you're a safety member, you look at this side and you find which tier you're in and you just look at that one column. So let me give you an example. If you're a general tier four member and you retire at age 60, when we go to calculate your retirement, we're gonna come to this chart. We're gonna go to general tier four. We're gonna come down to age 60 and we're gonna see that they intersect at 1.80%. That is the percentage of your highest salary that you would get for each year of service. And you'll note that the higher the age, the higher and higher the age factors become. And the 
um, they increase up until a maximum age factor percentage that you can achieve for your tier, which is denoted by the blue box for each one of the tiers. Okay. So if you retire older than the maximum age, if you retire at 67 and you're a general tier four member, you would get 2.50% of your highest salary for each year of service. If you retire at 68, so it'll be 2.50% and on and on. 69, 70, it maxes out at 2.50%. Um, one more thing that you might notice about this chart is I skipped a bunch of the ages. There's a big gaps in here. And that's because there's too many incremental age factor increases to fit on the slide. And it actually increases with every quarter of your birthday that you wait to retire. So if this were the full chart, it would say 60, 16 a quarter, 16 and a half, 16 three quarters, 61, and so on and so forth. And there would be a slight age factor percentage increase. Now to the person's question of like the impact of these on your retirement allowance, going up one notch in the age factor chart by aging a quarter year will increase your retirement allowance, re retirement allowance by somewhere between 1% and 2% just by crossing one of those quarter year dates. Um, and it and they kind of accelerate as you get older. Um, so that's kind of the impact that this would have. Uh, if you are curious to look at the full chart because you enjoy charts and or math, um, that chart is out on a website at acera.org slash age. The question, and there's a question, how do you know the age factor percentage that will be applied at the time of retirement? You don't because you cannot predict the future. And if you can predict the future, send me a direct message so that um, I can ask you some questions about my future. But if you can't predict the future, like uh, most of us, you won't know what age you will retire at. But what you can do is you can just kind of think about what you know when you might want to retire and do some scenarios and use our benefit estimate tool when you log into your account on our website to do different um, scenarios. And um, and that's kind of how you get a picture of, you know, the different amounts of pension that you could receive in, in a few different scenarios. And I'll, I'll take you, I'll walk you through that later on in the presentation. And the reason that there's no increase between uh, 65 and 67 for tier two is because that's just how it was written into law. All of these tiers are written in state law and the county or your employer adopted the tier for you and um, that's just what, you know, the, the set of age factor percentages that your employer chose for you. And these are written in stone. People ask, well, do these percentages change? They do not. Okay. So if you are in a particular tier, um, sorry, I went back. If you're in a particular tier, this is going to be your set of age factor percentages when you go to retire. Okay, I think that is all I wanted to tell you about the age factor percentages. And that's a lot of information to throw at you, especially if you're a new employee. If you don't want to remember any of that, you may not remember any of that. Here's the bottom line with age factor percentages. Older retirement age equals a higher age factor percentage. And because the higher age factor percentage is one of the multipliers in the retirement formula, it gives you a higher pension. Okay, so the older you are for this um factor in the formula, the higher the your retirement allowance will be, the higher your pension will be, up to the maximum for your tier. Okay, so we talked about the age factor percentage. Let me tell you about the years of service credit. You start earning service credit when you enter ACERA, and you will earn service credit all the way up until you terminate your employment. Now, for some of you who go straight into retirement, um, this will be the day before your retirement date. Some of you won't be, and there will be a gap between these two dates, and that's okay. And we'll talk about in the second half of the presentation what happens if uh, you do that. And there's a question, after the max age factor percentage, what would be the benefit of working longer? Good question. If you reach the maximum age factor percentage for your tier by getting to one of the blue boxes, Yes, the age factor percentage will not go up if you work longer, but the service credit will continue to go up because you're earning more and more service credit. And your salary will likely continue to go up through cost of living increases and raises, or maybe you get a, you know, a higher level job. Um, it could go up. So 
the service credit and the salary could keep going up and that could um, give you a higher retirement allowance. Okay, so when do you earn service credit? You earn service credit while you work your regular work hours. You also earn service credit during your earned leave. So while you're out on earned vacation, sick leave, management leave, comp time, holidays, floating holidays, you're already earning service credit during all of those types of leave. Those don't count against you in terms of earning service credit toward retirement. You're earning service credit during that time. Times when you do not earn service credit is any time you are out on leave without pay, you're not earning service credit. Also, if you purchase vacation, some of our employers will allow you to do that, purchase like an extra week or two of vacation on top of your earned vacation. When you go out on that purchase vacation and mark that on your timesheet, you're not earning service credit during that time, okay? But it's actually not that big a deal because if you miss a week here or there due to a purchased vacation, it's not going to have a huge impact on your retirement allowance, especially if you have like a, you know, 10, 15, 20 year career. It's, you know, it, it'll, it's going to be peanuts how it changes your, your earnings. So I wouldn't sweat it. If you need to go out on a purchased vacation, I think it's probably worth it. Also, if you sell vacation back to your employer for cash, um, you're, you don't get service credit for that. But if you do that um, at the toward the end of your career, during your what will the period that we're going to use to calculate your salary for calculating your retirement, that may increase your salary. I'll, I'll mention that when we talk about the salary component of the formula, but I won't take a deep dive into that today. But um, you do not get service credit for that sold vacation. You also don't get service credit for overtime, on-call time, or standby time. So you're not earning service credit during these types of time. There's a question, does FMLA time count towards service credit? Um, it can count towards service credit. FMLA is the federal, you know, the Family Medical Leave Act. It's a federal act, federal government law. And it says that um, you, can't, you can't be let go from your job if you're out on a medical leave, basically. Usually when you're out on FMLA, FMLA leave, you're using sick leave. You're using your sick leave accruals. So if you're using your sick leave accruals, then you are earning service credit for that already. Now, let's say that it's an extended FMLA leave. You can FMLA can last up to 12 weeks. You run out of sick leave, and then you're just on medical leave without pay. Well, that could become purchasable. And then you could, when you get back from that leave, you could buy that time back. Um, and uh, that and that would make it so that you wouldn't lose that time. Okay, let me talk about purchasing service credit since we're on that topic. The idea here is that there are some types of time that you incur during your career that if the situation were slightly different, maybe you could have earned service credit for that, but because the situation was what it was, the law doesn't allow for you to earn service credit. But then, because you know the situation was was what it was, your employer, you know, under the law, allows you to then purchase that time if you choose. Okay, so it's totally optional. If you want to purchase that time, um, you could purchase that. And what that would do is increase the service credit number in the formula for you. And if you recall. If you have more service credit, you get a higher retirement allowance. So here are the categories of time that are purchasable. The first one is called ineligible non-covered service purchase. And this will often, you will often incur this type of time prior to your full-time retirement eligible position. So I'm talking, so this is inclusive of part-time work. And I'm not talking about working for a temporary agency or working under contract because those are not, not purchasable. This is plain old part-time. If you started out working for your employer part-time and then you um, obtain a full-time retirement eligible position, you didn't earn service credit for that part-time work. But now that you are a, a member of Acera, you can go back and you can buy that part-time work. Um, the same thing goes for TAP time. TAP ta stands for the county's temporary assignment pool. All of the TAP time is purchasable. And there was a question up on the board 
Um, does tap time count toward vesting requirements? Yes. All of these service credit purchases count toward vesting as long as you make the purchase. If you don't purchase the tap time, then it would not count toward the vesting requirements. So you have to actually have to purchase the time for it to count toward the vesting requirement. And there's some other categories, like subcategories in this category. Uh, seasonal work, intermittent work, services needed, project, per diem work. These are kind of labels that they put on different types of work that are all eligible for you to purchase as service credit. Okay, the next one is the two-week lag between your date of hire and your entry date. If you're in the county, Alameda Health System, or one of our employers that has a two-week lag, you can purchase that two weeks. Um, then there's unpaid medical leave. So this was what I was referring to when we came onto the slide. If you're out on um, medical leave, and you, you've probably burned through all your sick leave, so you're just out on unpaid medical leave, when you return from the medical leave, you can buy that time up to one year um, per instance. Um, and, the, and returning from leave means that you receive um, a paycheck from your employer. And then, so, so one year's worth of time. So if you're out on unpaid medical leave for a year, you return to work or you receive a paycheck from your employer, and you go out on an unpaid, another year of unpaid medical leave, you return to work, both of those years are eligible for purchase, but the limit is one year per instance, okay? And it's for your medical condition only, not a, a family member's medical condition. So if you are like helping an elderly relative with um, with something medical related, or if you're out on paternity leave, um, unfortunately, those don't count toward this unpaid medical leave. Um, it has to be for your medical condition. State disability insurance leave is um, uh, very similar to unpaid medical leave. If you are out because you are being paid from the state disability insurance system because you are injured, or if you're out on workers' comp, same thing. Um, when you return from that leave, you can purchase that time. And sometimes you'll get a paycheck from your employer as you're getting a paycheck from the state for workers' comp. And if that's occurring, you are earning service credit for the portion of your time where you're getting paid from your employer, but not for the workers' comp portion. So then when you return from that, you can buy the workers' comp portion. And we'll help you sort that all out. Okay. Military leave during membership. Um, same thing upon return. I don't think there's a limit on that though. So this is, if you go out on military leave during your active membership, when you come back, you can buy that time. This isn't for prior military service. Okay, let me see if there's any questions on those before I move on to the other three categories. So buying back tap time, is that considered earning credit? It's not really considered earning, it's considered purchasing service credit. And when you log into your account after a service credit purchase, you'll see that separated out. You'll see um, on your on your in your Acera account, you'll see earned per, earned uh, service credit and purchase service credit. The COVAL leave hours is another question up on the board. Um, I do believe you earned service credit for that. So that did not count against you. Um, already so you would not have to purchase that and then does the eligible service credit purchase have to occur within a certain time period from non-covered service it does not the only deadline for you to purchase service credit is you have to finish paying for it by the time you retire it's best to purchase it as soon as you can though and i'll tell you in just a minute why because it's cheaper but let me do the other three um categories first. Okay. Redeposits of prior memberships. This is where you used to be an ACERA member in the past. You stopped working for your employer. And when you did that, you took a refund of your employee contribution account. So everything you paid into ACERA, you said, I want my money back and took it with you. You went and worked somewhere else. And now you're back here working again. You're an ACERA member again. And you're thinking, man, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have pulled that money out. I want my service credit back from that original membership. Well, you can do that. And that's called a redeposit of a prior membership. You just put the money back. You give us the money back that you had taken out, uh, plus interest, which I'll get to in a minute, and uh, and and you get your service credit back from that original membership. Okay, next category: redeposit of community property. So, if you are married or you're in a state-registered domestic partnership, um, 
and you are in that marriage or domestic partnership uh, while you are earning credit with a Sarah, um, when you divorce, if you divorce or if you dissolve that domestic partnership, your assets are probably going to be divided. And one of the things that could be on the table for division is your credit with a Sarah. Um, so one of the options is if you get divorced, your ex-spouse would take part of your account. So they would get part of your service credit and a corresponding part of your, um, your money your, that you have on deposit with us, your employee contribution account. Um, if you're, they would get a separate account and if your ex-spouse takes a refund of that money because they're looking for cash, we'll let you know. We'll send you a letter saying that they did that and give you the opportunity to purchase that equivalent amount of time. You can put in that equivalent amount of money to get your service credit back. And that's called a redeposit of community property. Okay, last category, other California prior public service. This is when you used to work for another state agency or another agency within California. It doesn't have to be for the state. And you're not eligible for to receive a pension from their system. And it's usually because you either haven't worked there for long enough or when you left there, you took a refund from their system. You can buy that time as a Sarah service credit. To give you an example, if you worked for East Bay Mud for a year, you stop working there, you come work for the county. You want to buy that year as a Sarah service credit. You can do that as long as you... Um, take a withdrawal of your money from East Bay Mud's uh, pension fund. So you you um, take a withdrawal of that, and then you can use that money to buy the um, service credit with a Sarah, and you can buy a year's worth of credit. Or if you had five years with East Bay Mud, you could buy five years worth of a, a service credit with a Sarah. Okay, now there's some times that are not eligible for purchase. Vacation purchase time. Uh, I already told you, you don't earn service credit. You can also not purchase that time back. But like I said, you don't even sweat that because it's a little, you know, it's kind of peanuts here and there. Non-medical leave without pay. So if you're out on leave without pay and it's not medically related, it's not purchasable. I already mentioned this contract time or temporary agency time, employment agency time, that's not purchasable. And then you cannot make that other prior public service credit purchase if you still have funds on deposit um, with that other agency. So we do require that you take a refund of your, um, your money from that other agency. Now, if you are eligible, let me, let me just give you a caveat here. If you're eligible for a pension over in that other agency, like you did five years or 10 years with CalPERS, you actually probably don't want to take that money out. You probably want to leave it there because they're going to pay you a pension. So if you are eligible for a pension with one of these, like you've earned enough credit, you probably just want to leave the money there and don't, don't take it out and don't try to purchase a Sarah service credit with it because it can be pretty pricey for this, um, for this one. Let me see if there's a question up here. Okay, the question is, is there a maximum amount of service credit allowed? If we work 40 years at the county and retire at 67, that would result in 100% income replacement during retirement. Um, if, okay, yeah. So if you if you work long enough, you could get up to 100% income replacement, but there is a rule that says that you can't earn more in retirement than whatever we calculate your highest average salary to be. Basically, you can't earn more in retirement than you were earning as a working person. So there does come a point in some people's career where they've worked long enough where they're basically working for free because if they went ahead and retired, they would earn the exact same salary from a Sarah in their pension benefit. Um, but some people just like their jobs and they continue to do that. Um, me personally, I like my job plenty, but not enough to continue working for free. So that's that's up to you. Okay, so. Uh, I do I do actually really like this part of the job, especially where I get to help you all understand, like, I mean, this is a complicated, you know, tons of rules, like three hours worth of rules. So I'm sorry it's so complicated, but I'm but I'm doing my best to make it easy for you all. Okay, so let's see, where was I? These times are not eligible for purchase. Okay, let me tell you how much it's gonna cost to make one of these service credit purchases if you're if you're interested in it. Um your 
cost for making a service credit purchase is going to be whatever your employee contributions had been had you worked that time. Let me give you an example. You go out on three months worth of unpaid medical leave. You return from that unpaid medical leave and you go back to work. You want to buy that three months. Okay, had you been working here, you would have been getting paychecks. Because um, remember, this is unpaid medical leave. You were not receiving paychecks. Okay. Had you been working, you would have been getting paychecks. And when you would have been getting paychecks, part of your money would have come out as your employee contributions and been sent to Acera and to Acera's fund. Whatever that amount of money would have been, that is how much it's going to cost you to purchase that three months of time. Plus the interest that that money would have earned between then and now. Okay. If you return from that three months of medical leave and you submit a service credit purchase request immediately, there we would not have had time to invest that money and earn interest, so it would just cost you the employee contributions. Let's say that you wait five years, and then you try to go to purchase it. Okay, well, now we have uh, two interest periods per year, the first six months and the last six months of the year that we post, um, you know, that we earn interest and post any interest we earn to member accounts. So your money from that three months that you would have paid into the system, we would have invested with the Sarah's fund. And five years has gone by. That's 10 individual interest periods that it would have had a chance to earn interest. So whatever interest that he would have earned had we invested it, you're also going to have to pay that interest. Okay. And we'll tell you what that is. You don't have to calculate this. Okay. And that's why I said earlier, the longer you wait to... Um, purchase service credit, the more expensive it gets. Another way to say that is the best time to purchase service credit is as soon as you can. You have different, um, or the way to uh, purchase service credit is this. You go to our website, you log into your account. You can go to acera.org slash WMS, um, or uh, actually acera.org slash login. They'll both take you to the same place. Or just go to acera.org, click the login button. It all goes to the same place. You log into your account. There's a form in there that is a purchase redeposit request. You fill it out. We will do the calculations for you. We'll send you a letter in the mail telling you how much it's going to cost. At that point, you can decide if you want to actually go through with the service credit purchase. And in many cases, you can even decide how much of the service credit purchase you want to make. Going back to the list of um, different types of service credit purchases, all of the types of time, except for the two redeposits, you could buy a portion of the time if you feel like you can only afford a portion of it at this point. Um, the redeposits are all or none. You have to either redeposit all of, all of the money or none of it. Uh, one more thing I'll mention while I'm on this slide is that for all of these um, top bullets, what you will be paying is the employee contribution plus interest portion. For the other California prior public service times, you pay the employee and the employer um, contribution portions, and the employer usually contributes at a higher rate than the employees uh, for various reasons. And that means that these other pri California prior public service purchases can be like triple what the, the other types um, where you're just paying the employee portion. So that's why I said these can be a lot more expensive. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind. And then you do have a few different payment options. If you have some money sitting around in a bank account, you could write us a check on a post-tax basis to make the purchase. Or if you have some money sitting in a retirement account, like a 401k, 403b, 457, IRA, you could roll over money on a pre-tax basis to make the purchase. Um, if you don't have either one of those, we can just split up the cost of it through payroll deductions uh, on a post-tax basis. So if you're trying to buy like six months worth of time, we can split it up for you over a maximum of six months and we'll take it right out of your paycheck. Or you can do any combination. So we'll, we'll help you get all that set up. And then, um, okay, let me, let me check on, let me see if I have any questions on this. Can I purchase service credit for vacation time sold? No. Oh, sorry about that. Once you once you um, sell the vacation back to your employer, you do get cash, but you can't purchase that back. 
Um, how do you, there's a question, how do you get the closest to 100% of your salary as your retirement benefit? Let me hang on to that question. I have a chart that will show you how to do that. Another question, can I purchase service credit for vacation time sold? Same question. Um, the answer is no. And then does the employer contribute after the employee purchases service credit? Yes. So when you purchase all of those first bullet points where you're only paying the employee contribution, yes, your employer will be making a contribution on your behalf. Now, let me just step, take a step back here and say that the, if you, if at, at ever point in the, any point in the future, you stop working here and you take a refund of your contribution account, you never get the employer contributions. Those always stay with the fund. The only way that you take advantage of the employer contributions is by retiring from ACERA and collecting that um, lifetime pension benefit. Then the employer contributions um, will help pay for part of your lifetime pension. Can you show this, the previous slide ways to purchase service credit again quickly? Sure. Yeah, so you got the lump sum check, a rollover from another type of retirement account, um, split it up over payroll deductions or any combination of the three. Um, these slides are out. If you go to acera.org slash seminars, um, these slides are available as a PDF download um, if you wanted to download these later. Okay, so sometimes I get this question, is purchasing service credit worth it? Well, I can't definitively answer that for you as an individual. Um, or even as a group, but you can figure it out for yourself, okay? Well, you can, what you can do is you can log into our website. Like I said, acera.org slash WMS slash login, or just go to acera.org, click the login button, log into your account. When you get in there, you're going to click the benefit estimator. I might have, yeah, I do have a screenshot of that. So this is how, this is the tool that you're going to go to to estimate a benefit. And what you're going to do in the benefit estimator is you're going to think of some plausible retirement scenario for you. And the first step is to um, put in a separation date and a projected retirement date. So when I say a plausible retirement scenario, I mean, let's see, maybe I'll retire in 10 years from now. And what are a couple of dates that would fit that scenario? And I plan to work straight into retirement. So I'm just going to pick two consecutive dates 10 years from now, or in this case, it's seven years from now. Or I know I'm going to work for 10 years and I'm going to quit. And then maybe I'm going to wait to retire, you know, another five years after that. So you could put in that scenario here and you hit calculate. And this will do a um, projection where it's projecting an amount of service credit you will have earned in the scenario and it's doing a salary projection for you. Okay. Now what you're going to do is you're going to do this twice. Okay. To figure out if whether, if making a service credit purchase is worth it, you do this twice. Okay. You do it once, and in, in both cases, you're going to use the same set of dates here, the same set of separation and projected retirement date. Okay, in estimate number one, you put in your set of dates. You do not fill out anything in the service credit override blank, which is this field right here. You leave it blank. You hit get estimate. Okay, you end up with estimate number one. It's a PDF. It will tell you a dollar amount that is your, your pension benefit. Okay. Now, estimate number two, um, you're going to do the same thing. Okay. So you run the first one, you get the PDF. Estimate number two, you run it, you put in the same set of dates, but this time you are going to put a number in this override service credit field. So you're going to take this number here, the projected service credit in this scenario, and you're going to add the amount of service credit you're trying to buy. So let's say you're trying to buy three months of time. That's a quarter year. That's 0.25. So you get out your calculator. You take this number. You add 0.25. You put that new grand total in the override service credit bank. Hit get estimate. Okay. It's going to give you another PDF that has a higher retirement allowance. Because you have more service credit in estimate number two, you're going to get a higher retirement allowance. Okay. Then you're going to compare the two. You can take estimate number two and you subtract estimate number one, and it tells you the difference between the two estimates. Basically, how much more estimate two is paying you because you made the service credit purchase. Okay, then 
you know how you, so now you know how much money you're of an increase you're going to get in your retirement allowance based on making the service credit purchase. Okay. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take the purchase cost. This is going to be on the letter that we send you in the mail after you submit the, um, the service credit purchase form. So let's say that it's a thousand. We tell you it's going to cost a thousand dollars to make the service credit purchase. Okay. All you need to do is divide that dollar amount by the increase from estimate number one to estimate two. And that's going to tell you how many months it's going to take to get that back. So if the increase from estimate one to estimate two is $100, a $1,000 service credit purchase divided by $100 is only going to take you 10 months of higher retirement payments to get that $1,000 back. That's That seems very worth it to me. Like if it's going to take a year to get the money back or a few years, five years, maybe even 10 years in higher retirement allowance payments, because um, you're going to get that higher retirement allowance for the rest of your life. And after the higher retirement allowance pays for itself um, by giving you the money back that it costs to purchase that service credit, then you're just going to have like a higher retirement allowance for the rest of your life. Okay, so that's how you that's how you figure that out for yourself. Okay, there's a question. If you purchase, uh, and I think somebody raised a hand, um, just as a reminder, we are uh, entirely utilizing the Q&A feature today. And if you're on a phone, um, I think in the Zoom app, you can just tap on the, um, the Zoom screen one time and options will pop up and you can type in a question into the Q&A. Okay, if you purchase a TAP, does it count toward the 10-year medical vesting? Yes. All of the service credit purchases count toward the 10-year medical vesting. And it's not really vesting per se. It's like a 10-year eligibility requirement for the medical benefits. We'll talk about that uh, in just a uh, in the second half of the presentation. Next question, when I do the benefit estimator, does it take into account the future across the board raises that are stipulated in the MOU? It does not. So if you want to see the, going back to the benefit estimate screenshot, if you want to see the effect of higher salaries, we do give you a field where you can override the average salary. What the projected final average salary is basically doing is taking your last pay period as on file and it's filling out any pay periods in your final compensation period, which I'll talk about um, actually right now when I talk about the third component in the formula. Um, so it's basically using your current salary. So if you're not going to retire for many years, you may want to just for the heck of it, see what the effect of a higher salary would be on your pension benefit. So I told you about the age factor percentage. I gave you some details about the years of service credit. Let me tell you about the highest average monthly salary component of the formula. When you go to retire, we are going to um, determine your highest average monthly salary so that we can do this calculation. And we're going to take an average not across your entire career, but just a subset of your career. It's going to be your highest period of consecutive pay in your career. And in our pension lingo, this is known as your final compensation period. If you're in tiers one and three, your final compensation period is your highest consecutive 26 biweekly or 12 monthly pay periods, depending on how you're paid. And if you're in tiers two and four, it's your highest consecutive 78 biweekly or 36 monthly pay periods, depending on whether you're paid biweekly or monthly. So what we're going to do is uh, for us at tiers one and three, essentially, it's your highest one year of pay. And for tiers two and four, it's essentially your highest three years of pay. What we need to do to determine the average um, salary across that time period is we just need to do a simple, you know, just take a simple average. So we'll take your total pay in tiers one and three across that highest year of pay and divide it by 12 months. And that gives us an average. For tiers uh, two and four, we look at your total pay during the highest three years. We divide it by 36 months and that gives us an average. And that's the number that we use in the retirement formula for you. Um, and we're talking about gross pay here. So the types of pay that will be included is, of course, your base pay. And then there could be some other pay codes. Some of you may have other pay codes in there that are on top of your base pay. These are sometimes called footnotes. Um, you'll see them on your pay stub. 
I can't tell you off the top of my head whether your pay code will count toward your salary for calculating your retirement or not. And that's because there's like a thousand different pay codes. Some of them count, some of them don't. But you can go to our website, acera.org, go to the pay codes page. You can search for pay codes or just go to acera.org slash pay codes. And you can find a list of the pay codes for your employer and you can find out for yourself. You go just go down to your pay code and it'll say yes or no, whether it is included uh, as highest average salary for the purposes of calculating your retirement. Overtime is the one pay code that I know never counts. Okay, now somebody referenced this earlier um, in one of the questions. Vacation sales and vacation cash out for tiers one and two. If you're um, compensated for your earned vacation by selling your vacation back to your employer while you're still employed, or you simply have vacation left over on the books when you stop working and retire, um, some of that vacation compensation can be included as salary. Now that is a, it's a huge, it, it's kind of a big topic. Um, I might spend 20 or 30 minutes talking about that in the pre-retirement seminar because this is a new employee and mid-career seminar. I'm not going to take a deep dive into that right now. If you do want that information, like you are curious about that, um, I totally understand because uh, it's, it's an interesting topic. What I recommend doing is going out to our website, uh, going to acera.org slash seminars, or just searching for seminars. Um, in fact, I'll just show you where to find that right now. So here's our website. You go under um, news and events, go down to retirement planning seminars, or you just go to acera.org slash seminars. And if you scroll down, you'll see that um, there are past recordings of all of these webinars. So when we post this one, it will be on this list. And you can just click on whatever the most recent pre-retirement seminar is. Uh, fast forward, it's all, they're all, they're all um, hosted on YouTube. Fast forward through it until you find this slide. It looks, it looks exactly the same. And that's when we launch into that discussion. Okay. But that would be one tip for maximizing that goes to that original question. One tip for maximizing um, retirement. If you're in tiers one and two, um, it doesn't work for tiers three and four. Okay. And then there's a question, does the uh, benefit estimator take into consideration step increases? It does not. So you would have to use the, um, the salary override field to calculate that manually. There's a question, does the employer contribute after the employee purchase service credit? Can you answer it again? I missed it. Oh yeah. So if you make an, um, one of the service credit purchases, all of the types of service credit purchases, except for the where you're purchasing time from another agent, California public agency, so we're just talking about the ACERA service credit purchases, your employer will make a contribution um, uh, to ACERA's fund on your behalf. But like I was saying before, if you're looking for a withdrawal of your contribution account later on, when you, uh, when you stop working here, you will never be able to withdraw the employer contribution part, portion. You only are able to withdraw the employee contribution portion. The only way to take advantage of what your employer is contributing to your retirement is by retiring from a SARA and drawing that lifetime pension. Okay. So for tier four members, there are some limits to your benefit payments um, that don't apply to tiers one, two, and three. And I just want to mention this um, so that you're cognizant of this. There is this limit built into the law, the state law that created tier four, where we have to cap your salary at a certain point. So if you have a high salary, for general members, the salary for 2023 is $146,042. For safety members, it's $175,250. Um, if you earn a high, if you have a higher salary than that, what happens is at the point in the year where you have already earned this much money, we stop taking contributions out of your paycheck for the rest of the year. Um, so we cannot calculate more um, salary for that particular year than this max when we go to calculate your retirement. 
And, but what it means is because we stopped taking the retirement contributions out of your check, it does leave you more money in your check to contribute to your 457B plan. Um, if you have a 457B or, you know, your personal savings, there's more information about that at assert.org slash limits. These numbers go up um, every year. So uh, it's based on some number that social security gives us. So um, these numbers will be higher by the time that you go to retire. Okay, now to bring it all together, this is the whole equation put together. In this example of the retirement allowance formula, this tier four member is retiring at age 65 after earning 25 years of service credit. Okay, so because they're a tier four member and they're retiring at age 65, their age factor percentage from the chart is 2.30%. So they're gonna get 2.30% of their highest salary, which in this case is $6,000 for each one of those 25 years of service. Um, so we multiply all these three things together and that means their monthly retirement allowance is $3,450 that they'll get every month for the rest of their life but they will also get cost of living adjustments, which is a percentage increase each year to that monthly retirement allowance to help them keep up with inflation. In this particular case, if we see, if we, if we look at, um, if we multiply these two numbers together, the age factor percentage times the years of service credit. So this is the percentage of their salary they're earning for each year of service times the years of service we see that they're achieving 57.5% salary replacement just from their ACERA retirement allowance alone. And that is really good because they will have some money from Social Security coming in likely um, if they've been paying into the Social Security system. And then with their personal savings, that will get them over that 70 to 80% mark. Okay, let's talk about getting a pension estimate. I'm going to show you two ways to get a pension estimate. Um, let's see here. Let me do this one first. Okay, one way to get a, this is kind of one way to get kind of a ballpark estimate, but it also is a chart that helps you think about how much of your pension you're earning from year to year. Okay, so we have these charts out on our website. Let me go, let me show you our website um, and show you how to get there. So from our website, acera.org, you go under members and the third selection down is planning your future retirement income, or you can just type in acera.org slash planning. Okay. Now, the first step on this page is to get an ACERA estimate, and it gives you four ways to get an ACERA estimate. Um, the first option is the one I'm talking about now, which is to, to examine one of these um, income replacement charts. So I'm just going to click on the general tier four chart. You can find your tier here. You just click on the button for your tier. And this is going to pop open a PDF chart. What we've done in this chart is we've already multiplied out the age factor percentages times the years of service, so you don't have to do it. So what you do to use this chart is you look at the two axes. Across the top is the age at retirement, and across the left-hand side is years of service credit. And when you think about a plausible retirement scenario for you. Like, let's say that I'm... Um, age 30, and I'm going to retire at age 62, maybe. Let's see what happens if I do that, okay? So I'll come down here. To, so age um, 30 years, uh, okay. Now, now what I got to do, age 30 to 62, okay, that's 32 years of service credit, and I'm retiring at age 62. So I want to come down here and look at 32 years of service credit, and what happens if I retire at age 62? That's 64% income replacement. So that's pretty good. Okay. Um, let's take a different scenario. Let's say I only want to, on average, people retire with 20 years of service credit. What if I was um, 42 right now and I was going to retire at age 62? What would happen? Okay. So that would be uh, 20 years of service credit retiring at age 62. That would give me 40% income replacement. Okay. 
So that, when I say income replacement, that means that my retirement allowance is going to be 40% of my working salary, roughly. One thing that this will allow you to do is you can th kind of think about that scenario. And then you can think, okay, in that scenario where I'm 42 now and I'm going to retire at age 62, maybe, and I'm achieving 40% income replacement, what would happen if I worked a year more? Well, I would get another year older and I would earn another year of service credit. So you go diagonally from there and you see that working another year would give me 44% income replacement. Working another year after that diagonally would be 48.40%. Going another year diagonally would be 52.90% income replacement. So just by working another three years, I would go from about 42% um, in, where was it? 40% income replacement to over 50% income replacement in that scenario. That's one thing that this allows you to do. If you, if you go back in time one year, you can see, well, what if I don't want to work 20 years? I'll work 19. Well, I would get 36% income replacement. So that's what's nice about these charts. And, it, and like I said, it just kind of gives you a ballpark of, it, it tells you what income, income replacement percentage you're achieving. And it kind of gives you a ballpark of what your retirement allowance would be. Because you could take that 40% and multiply it by your salary right now. And um, that would you know kind of give you an idea of what you would be expecting as your retirement allowance um, in retirement. So that's one way to get an idea of what to expect as you, from your, um, like what you will be earning, I, I mean, what you will be receiving as your ASERA pension. Oh, and one thing, uh, I did want to address that question. Let me just go back to the chart real fast. There was a question earlier, how do you get the closest to 100% of your salary as your retirement benefit? What you're going to want to do is look at this chart and see where the 100% start, Okay. Now, because you're a certain age and you already are earning a certain amount of service credit, you are probably going to be on one of these diagonal trajectories. Um, so you can just kind of find where you, you know, where that diagonal meets now, and you can just kind of go diagonally down to see if you can um, achieve 100%. You know, you may find that you'll have to, you know, work to too old of an age or work too many years um, to get there. Maybe not. Maybe you could get to 100%. Um, but like in this case for tier four, this person would have to work 42 years and be age 66. Um, so they would have had to start working at what, 22 and work all the way to 66 and they would achieve 100% income replacement. You'll notice that none of these say over 100% because like I was saying earlier, you cannot earn more than 100% of whatever we calculate your um, highest average monthly salary to be. So 100% is a limit and that is written into law. And there was a question, uh, show me again where you find these charts at acera.org. You go under members, you go down to planning your future retirement income. It's the third selection. Or you can just simply type in acera.org slash planning. You scroll down under step number one get into Sarah estimate. It gives you four options for getting an estimate. You open up option number one, there's an accordion and there's some buttons in there and that will um, open up these PDF charts. Okay, now what I'm gonna show you is option two, which is using the benefit estimator. And there's a step-by-step -step in there. I'll just show it to you out on the presentation because I have some screenshots. And yeah, there was a question, is there a cap on how much you can get as a pension? Yep, 100% of your final average salary is the cap. And then there's a question, is this chart for tier four? Can I use it for tier two? No, you would want to look at the tier two chart. So when you go to that planning page and you open up option number one, you just click on, if you're a general tier two member, you click on tier two A. If you're a safety member, you find your appropriate tier and you open up the chart for your tier. You don't want to, you don't want to use the wrong chart because that will give you an incorrect, incorrect number. And there's a comment. My coworker has been working for the county for 56 years. She's still working. That's amazing. She's uh, definitely one of those, or it sounds like she may be one of those people who is uh, who loves her job and she's just loves her public service role. And that's amazing.
Um, and there's a question, why is there a reference to social security cap at the top of the calculator? Is it related to um, the contribution cap? Let's see. For tier four, there's a reference to the social security cap because it's that, um, it's that limit that I was telling you about um, for tier four members. You can't, it's um, this slide right here. For tier four members, we can only include um, up to this amount of salary in our calculation for the purposes of calculating your highest average salary for calculating your retirement, okay? So when you're, think when you're looking at the chart and you're thinking about your salary and your income replacement, if you are over this cap, and let's say that you find your you know, you're at 50% income, or you would be at 50% in income replacement. It's only 50% of this cap if you're over the cap. Okay. Here's the second way. You're welcome. Definitely. Here's the second way to get a retirement estimate. And I like to call this one the precision way to do it rather than the ballpark way to do it. So you go out to our website, acera.org, you click the login button. Um, it will take you to a login screen, which I'm not going to show you. You log in. Um, if you've never done it before, you just create an account and you can log in. Okay. When you get in there, you'll see an account summary screen and it will show you many, much of your pension data, including your tier, whether you have elected reciprocity, your date of entry, um, your date of birth, if anything, your amount of service credit that you've earned, how much you've purchased. If anything seems incorrect, definitely give us a call. Um, and you can find our contact information out on our website. Um, but the phone number is 510-628-3000. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll revisit that number later on in the presentation. Okay, so this is your account summary screen. You click Estimate a Benefit. And um, I was already showing you a screenshot of this benefit estimator. And let me just zoom in um, to make it a little bit bigger for you. You think of a plausible retirement scenario for you. In this one, this person is retiring in seven years. Okay. And the separation date, if you are going straight into retirement, if that's your plan, I'm just going to work here until I retire. Your separation date and your projected retirement date would be two consecutive days. Your separation date is your last day on payroll. Your projected retirement would be the next day after that. You hit calculate. Now, if you're somebody who's planning on leaving early, you're only going to work for 10 years maybe, you put your separation date here. And then if you're not going to retire immediately, you think of a scenario where you would retire sometime after that, and you put that date in here and you hit calculate. And what it will do is project an amount of service credit that you will have earned in this uh, working and retirement scenario. And it's also doing a salary projection for you. Now, if you want a nice conservative estimate, just leave all of the override fields blank. Don't put in hours of cash vacation compensation. You can select a beneficiary here if you want. Hit get estimate. And what you end up with is this uh, PDF um, uh, retirement benefit estimate. And I'll just zoom in here so you can see it a little bit better. What it's showing you is um, your estimate for four of the five options. And I'm not going to take a deep dive into the options. I do that in the pre-retirement webinar. Um, you don't really, you don't choose this option until retirement. For right now, as a new member or a mid-career member, just look at this top line, unmodified option. This is the one that most people pick anyway, because it pays the highest retirement allowance to you as a retiree. And so this number right here, member monthly benefit, that is um, your retirement estimate for this retirement um, estimate PDF, Okay. Um, the beneficiary um, monthly benefit after your death, that's for a continuance for if you named a continuance beneficiary, but you don't really just for this point only worry about this number right here. And that's how you get a precision estimate. There's a question, is there a social security offset against your pension? There's a very slight one. If you are paying, if you are anybody but a safety member, if you're a general member, um, that means that you're paying into the social security system. And there's, I don't know why, but there's this way, this 
thing written into the law where there's a slight social security reduction amount. Um, it might be like $10 or something, 10 or $20. I don't know why they do it, um, but that it it's in there. Um, you, this, that's already calculated in this. So it's not going to be on top of this. That's already calculated in this. So you can just go by this number here and you don't really even have to worry about that. If you like math and you're curious, go out to that planning page that I just showed you, asera.org slash planning, planning, and it will um, it will show you how that how that is calculated. Does this estimate get sent to you by a Sarah or will it generate an estimate immediately? It generates an estimate immediately. It's a PDF. Um, you save it to your device and um, you can make as many of these as you want. You know, you can try out all different types of retirement scenarios. And this is the best, absolute best way to get in estimated monthly retirement benefit. Um, and this uses the same math that our staff would use if they were going to calculate it themselves anyway, because they use the same system. Okay, so let me move on. Let me help you understand your retirement eligibility. There's one question on the board that I did want to answer before I move on, which is um, the question is, at what ideal time should we submit our retirement benefit option and how frequently can we change this? The only time that you submit your retirement benefit option is at the time of retirement on your um, retirement application. So you do this right as you're retiring. You don't, you don't, you can pick it in your head before that, but you don't, you don't choose this until, until the point where you retire because you're, you're not, and you're probably not even going to want to, I mean, you can, you can think about it, but your situation between now and when you retire might look completely different. Um, and so that's why you choose this at the time of retirement. Okay, you, like I said earlier in the presentation, you become actually eligible to retire at a certain, at a certain milestone based on a combination of your years of service credit and age. So let me show you what those combinations are. If you're in tiers one, two, and three, um, you have three different combinations that would get you to retirement eligibility. And I'll do tier four in just a minute. Option number one is you're at least age 50 and you have at least um, 10 years of membership and service credit, basically. Um, bef this, there used to be a difference here, but it's been so long since tier four was created. And so all tier two members have probably have at least 10 years of service credit that you can just kind of think of it as 10 years of service credit and you're at least age 50. Okay. Um, but if there's some scenario that I'm not thinking about where you actually have less than 10 years of service credit and you're tier two, as long as you have at least 10 years of membership, you can still retire. Okay. So um, you really, the minimum is you need five years of service credit, 10 years of membership, and you're over age 50, and you can retire. Option number two is, as a general member, you can have 30 years of service credit, or as a safety member, you can have 20 years of service credit, and you can retire at any age, even if it's younger than the age 50 that you would need for option one. Option number three is, you can retire at age 70 with any amount of service credit, even if it's less than five years. So if you had four years of service credit, and you were in tiers one, two, or three, you could retire at age 70 um, and draw a lifetime pension from a Sarah. So you don't need to get up to the five years. So those are your options. I would say probably the vast majority of people um, become retirement eligible through option number one. They're at least age 50 and they have at least five years of ser service credit and 10 years of membership. Okay, option uh, for tier four, you have two options, two different combinations that get you to retirement eligibility. Um, as a general member, you can retire at age 52, or as a safety member, you can retire at age 50, as long as you have at least five years of service credit. Um, so it's the minimum of five years, and you can draw a lifetime pension from ACERA based on that five years of service credit or whatever it happens to be for you. 
Option number two is that you are age 70 and you can retire with any amount of service credit, even if it's less than five years. If it was four years or three years, let's say that you earn three years and you decide that you don't want to work here anymore. Um, you can leave your contributions on deposit with the Sarah and become what we call a deferred member. So you're not retiring yet when you stop working here and you're deferring your retirement to a later date. And once you reach age 70, you can submit a retirement application to a Sarah and start drawing a pension on that three or four years of service credit. Okay, let me talk about some additional benefits. There are other, other benefits that a Sarah offers besides the um, retirement allowance. There's medical, dental, vision, and other non-guaranteed benefits. Um, there's the disability retirement, which is if you become permanently disabled and you cannot perform your job duties anymore, you can apply for disability retirement. And if you're awarded a disability retirement, um, you would just ha uh, go out on disability retirement rather than the regular retirement, also known as service retirement. Um, the the uh, If you're permanently disabled, the opportunity to apply for disability retirement um, is guaranteed. And once you are, if you're awarded it, that it's also kind of considered a vested benefit. That's why it says guaranteed there. And then death benefits. So let me talk about uh, some of these. Let me talk about the non-guaranteed benefits first. This is something that, so these are, these are extra benefits. These are like, you know, the slide is labeled non-guaranteed benefits. It says non-guaranteed benefits in the table. Um, the kind of the point that's that we're trying to drive home is that these are not vested benefits. The, so these are not guaranteed. These are extra benefits that um, the county decided that their retirees needed to pay for their lives. Um, they, and so back in the 80s, they created a reserve fund to help pay for these benefits known as the Supplemental Retiree Benefits Reserve. And our Board of Retirement at ASERA manages that fund, and so they manage what the benefits are, and they, what they, their whole job is to keep the fund sustainable so that they're, they can um, offer these benefits into the future. So they might, they might um, adjust the benefits from time to time. They, sometimes they do that. They might reduce or eliminate them. Um, they usually don't eliminate them. I have only seen a couple of times they've reduced them, but they'll make little adjustments so that these benefits stay sustainable so that they can continue to offer health care and these other benefits. Because of that, there are rules that they have set up for you to qualify for these benefits, and it's based on years of service credit. So the main takeaway from this is that this is what the benefits currently are. There's medical subsidy. Um, MMA stands for monthly medical allowance. That's the name of the medical subsidy. Um, dental subsidy, vision subsidy, Medicare subsidy, and a supplemental cost of living adjustment. Um, these benefits could change. I don't foresee that happening. Um, so this, this is kind of like what they've settled on. Um, it's possible that the years to qualify could change, but I don't see that happening either. This is kind of what they settled on. Um, the main takeaway here is that the, you need a certain number of years of a Sarah service credit to start qualifying for the health care benefits, and the minimum is 10 years. Okay, so when you're doing your career planning, let's say that you've already been here nine and a half years, and you're thinking, okay, I'm getting kind of getting tired of this. Maybe it's time to try something new. Should I move on and quit this job? Maybe you want to stick it out for another six months, get over the 10-year mark, because a, a subsidy for your medical um, coverage, dental, vision, and Medicare that can represent a lot of additional money in retirement um, that you might want to take advantage of by getting over that 10-year mark. The supplemental cost of living, living adjustment is an extra COLA that helps um, you maintain your buying power, and that's the only one that you don't need 10 years to qualify for. And then the medical subsidy has three levels, and so if you achieve 15 or 20 years of a SARA service credit, you get a higher subsidy, basically, is what this is trying to say. So this stuff, this might look a little different, if you're, especially if you're a new employee, by the time you go to retire, it's possible. So that's, that's the kind of, that's the reason I'm just kind of touching on this at this point is um, just to show you the years of service credit it takes to qualify. And we might even want to just like add another milestone to the chart. The healthcare subsidies um, start at 10 years. So that might be a milestone to aim for. Okay, let me talk about the other benefit that was on that slide, the death benefits. And, and let me tell you about it in the context of designating your beneficiary or beneficiaries for them and keeping them current. 
So your beneficiary is somebody who gets a, a, a beneficiary. That word just means somebody who gets benefits. Your ACERA beneficiary is the person that you designate to get your ACERA death benefits, okay? So here's what the death benefits are that would go to your beneficiary or beneficiaries that you designate before your death, okay? If you're not vested with the Sarah, mean that means you don't have five years of service credit yet, um, but you are actively working and you're what we call an active member, which means that you're actively working for one of our six employers, you're actively paying employee contributions into the system, you're actively earning a service credit. Um, if you are an active member, but you're not yet vested yet, and should you pass away before retirement, um, what your beneficiaries would receive, beneficiary or beneficiaries, would be a return of the balance of your contribution account with ASERA. So all the employee contributions you paid into ASERA, plus all the interest that we have um, paid into your account based on the interest that that money has earned. Plus, they would get one month of your current salary for each year of service up to six months worth of salary. So like, let's say that you had already worked here for three years, they would get three months of your salary in addition to a refund of your contribution account. Okay, so that's for the non-vested members. If you have already achieved vesting, which means you have five years of a Sarah service credit already, then your beneficiaries would get a choice. And again, this is death benefits should you die before retirement. The death benefits, just to um, kind of take an aside here, the death benefits that are available to your beneficiaries after retirement is a completely different, and that's something that you select at the time of retirement. Okay, so we're just talking about death benefits before retirement. Now, if you're vested, your beneficiaries would get a choice. Option number one is the same, a return of, your, of the balance of your contribution account plus one month of salary for each year of service up to six months. That's option number one. They have two other options that they could take. Instead of option number one, they could take a monthly survivor's allowance. And it says to qualified beneficiary only, that is um, spouse, state registered domestic partner, Alameda County domestic partner, or minor children. So if they are named as your beneficiaries, they could um, get this monthly survivor's allowance. And if it's a spouse or domestic partner, they would get, it would be a lifetime allowance. Essentially what happens with, with this option two is that should you pass away, we would do a calculation of your retirement allowance at that time based on you know one of the retirement options, option number two, and um, provide them that allowance, um, like kind of simulating that you retired as of your death date. Um, and they would get that for the rest of their life it's a, if it's a spouse or domestic partner. Option number three, and, and we would... Um, at that point, we would tell them like what all the dollar amounts are for each one of these options. So they would get a chance to choose and what all the caveats are. Option number three is a hybrid of options one and two. They would get that lump sum one month of salary for each year of service up to six months. So that means if you've worked here eight years and you die as an active member, they would get six months worth of your salary. And then there would be a smaller monthly survivor's allowance. So those would be their three options. Now, should you stop working for your employer and not retire yet and become what we call a deferred member, um, the only death benefit that they would be eligible for is a return of the contributions and interest. So it would be a return of whatever the balance of your contribution account is. There is a lot more info about those death benefits out on our website. Um, if you go to acerta.org slash death, um, there's a whole page on the death benefits. But what I want to emphasize right now is you don't really, I mean, it. you don't really need to know what the death benefits are or memorize them, just know that they're out there. What you do need to keep track of is whether you've designated a beneficiary and if they're current, okay? You can change your beneficiary designation at any time. You do that on our beneficiary designation form on our forms page at acera.org slash forms, okay? All you do is you find the beneficiary designation form, you fill it out, and submit it to us. And that's how you designate your beneficiary. Um, if you don't remember who you named as a beneficiary, you can log into your account on our website 
and you can click on the nominated beneficiary page and you can see all of the people that you've nominated as your beneficiary. If you get in here and you find that your nominated beneficiary is your spouse from three spouses ago, you're probably going to want to go ahead and redesignate your beneficiary. And there's even some links here. Um, it will uh, take you to the death benefits page. Uh, and then it will take you to the benefic beneficiary designation form. So you can just go ahead and fill that out and submit it to us. Okay. Next topic, understanding career planning options. Okay, so there's a question up on the board from much earlier. What happens if you leave before hitting the five-year mark? We're going to get to that question during this topic. Okay, so when I say career planning options, what I mean is I don't mean um, retiring. I mean like planning out the rest of your career. Like what happens when you leave work here? Because eventually you're going to leave work here. Um, you, that's just the way the universe is designed, that you're, you're going to leave this job at some point in the future. So you have different options. What you can do regarding your ASERA membership and your, um, your uh, pension that you've earned with ASERA. So you have a, a few different options. So option number one is to work straight into retirement, which means that if you leave your job and you're already eligible to retire, let's say that you're over age 50 for tiers one, two, and three, or 52 um, for, as a, for general tier four or 50 for uh, safety tier four, and you've already earned the service credit that you need to retire, so you're already eligible to retire when you leave, you could just go ahead and retire, even if you're fairly young, like you're 52. You just go ahead and retire from a Sarah. Um, even if you want to go work for somewhere else, like you want to go work, you get some job over, you know, for like a tech company or something. Um, we're just going to consider you an ASERA retiree and we're going to pay you your retirement allowance every month for the rest of your life, even if it starts at age 52. Okay. So that's what I mean by working straight into retirement. So when you stop working here, if you're eligible to, re to retire, you can just go ahead and do that. Um, especially if you don't, you're, you're pretty sure you're never going to come back to work here again to earn more retirement, um, you just go ahead and retire. So that's option number one. If you work straight in a retirement, you will earn service credit right up until your retirement. Um, we will convert half of your sick leave to service credit. And um, like I said, you can go work somewhere else where you want and you can get your Sarah retirement at the same time. Okay, that's option number one. Now, option number two is terminating before retirement. So what this means is that maybe when you stop working, you're not eligible to retire yet, but you may want to retire in the future sometime. Or maybe when you stop working, you don't want to retire and you just want to withdraw your contributions. Or maybe when you stop working, you're going to go work for another California public agency and you want to link them together. Okay, so you have some different options in here. But the kind of the bottom line here is that you're not ready to retire from a SARA yet. Okay. Now, if you terminate before retirement, there is probably going to be a gap between if you do decide to retire from a SARA between your termination date and your retirement date versus if you were to go straight into retirement, they would be on consecutive days, okay? Option number one, and actually I'm going to letter these because I had options one and two. These are A, B, and C. So you have three options if you, um, when you stop working here and you're not ready to retire yet, options A, B, and C. Option A is to defer what we call coming a, becoming a deferred member. And the only thing that you need to do to become a deferred member is simply leave your contributions, your employee contributions on deposit with the SARA. When you leave your contributions on deposit with the SARA, you become a deferred member, which means you're still in a SARA member. The word member is in there, deferred member. Okay, you're still in a SARA member. And as an SARA member, um, we are going to continue to invest your contribution account. That means interest is going to continue to accumulate. And one unique thing to leaving your contributions on deposit with the Sarah is there's no negative interest. 
And people ask me, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is if a Sarah, let's say the market crashes and a Sarah's um, total fund loses money in the short term, like on paper, okay? Uh, if you had a, if you were privately invested, like if you own stock, um, if the stock price declined, you lost money on paper. That does that never happens with your Acera account. If we lose money temporarily, your account balance stays the same. Maybe we don't post, you know, maybe there's no interest earned for a particular interest period, but we don't take any money out of your account. So it's completely safe. There's no way to lose money. And there is really nowhere that you can park your money in this world that I'm familiar with where you can earn the type of interest that we earn, which is probably about 7% on average per year, if you look at the last 10 years. And um, there's no risk. There's like zero risk. So it's it's kind of a really safe place, you know, kind of an amazing thing. It's kind of a really ama amazing place to leave your money. Okay, so then if you're planning on retiring later, you don't really even worry about the balance of your contribution account because the balance, like how much money you paid in is not one of the factors in the retirement formula. So you just forget about it. Really, what you're focused on is the fact that you can retire later. So you become a deferred member with a SARA. And once you become retirement eligible, you can retire later out of deferred membership. And that's why there would be a gap between um, these two days is uh, between these two milestones is you leave employment and then you, you know, you retire at some later date. So you can retire later. You could even, if you wanted to, you can come back to work for one of our six employers employers, and you could earn more credit toward retirement. So let's say that you go do something else for a couple of years and um, it's, it's actually not great. It's not what you thought it was going to be. You can get another job working for one of our employers and you can pick up where you left off and become an active member again and earn more credit toward retirement. You can also be refunded at any time as a deferred member. So when you stop working, we're going to ask you to fill out this termination form and um, where you select whether you want to defer your retirement, you know, become a deferred member, you want to take a withdrawal. Um, you don't have to decide to do a withdrawal right now. If you don't know what the heck you're doing, maybe you'll come back work to work here, maybe not. Like If you are not ready to make that decision, just become a deferred member because you could take a refund later. Okay, So that's option A. Then there's a question, and I'll get to those other questions in just a few minutes. Um, there's a question, if you're a deferred member, can you still contribute to your pension? No. As a deferred member, you're just kind of on hold. So you cannot contribute to the pension, and you're, not, you're also not earning service credit. You're just kind of on hold where you left off. And that's just the way it works. Okay, so that's option A, is become a deferred member. Option B is establish reciprocity with a different California um, retirement system. And the reason that you would do this is, let's say that you get another job for another county in California or the state of California, or maybe one of the cities in California that we have a reciprocal agreement with. It prevents you from kind of starting over from scratch in terms of earning your retirement. So we can, you can establish reciprocity with many California cities, um, any of the counties, there's like 20 of them, I think, that have their own pension funds or any of the counties that use the state CalPERS uh, fund as their pension fund. Some counties do that. Any agency that uses CalPERS as its pension fund, um, we can establish reciprocity with. Any California state job, there's a list at um, acera.org slash reciprocity. And there are some benefits to establishing reciprocity. The benefits are that the service credit that you earn in all systems combined gets you over the vesting requirements and retirement eligibility. So if you work here for three years, then you go get a job over in Marin County for two years. Combined, you have five years, you're vested, okay? Um, or if you're trying to retire, you're at least age 52 in tier four, and you're trying to retire with that five years, you could do it if you've established reciprocity and linked the systems together. If you had three years in one and two years in the other, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be eligible to retire yet. Okay, so 
The second benefit is that the highest salary that you earn under any reciprocal system is used by all the systems when they calculate your retirement. So let's say that you're earning 20 bucks an hour here and you find a much higher paying job in Contra Costa County using uh, paying $30 an hour. And then you worked here for 10 years and you go over there and work five years, okay? If you link the systems together, when a Sarah goes to calculate your retirement based on the 10 years you worked here, we're going to use the higher salary that you're earning at the next system. So you're going to earn more from a Sarah by having a higher salary in a different system. And so that's what I mean. That's one of the main ways that it prevents you from having to start over from earning your retirement. And then um, if, you are, uh, if you started work before January 1st, 2013, that means that you're in an earlier tier it may keep your contribution rate lower. If you're in tier four, that, that's not really one of the benefits because um, tier four members pay, all pay the same rate, um, the same contribution rate. It's a flat rate across the entire tier. Okay, so in order to qualify for reciprocity, you got to do four things. One is that you got to defer in all of the systems that you want to link together. Okay, so let's say in that example, you're, you're making $20 an hour here. You get that job over in Contra Costa County making $30 an hour. You go over there, work for a couple of years. Um, what you would want to do is you leave your contributions on deposit with a Sarah. So you're basically selecting option A and then selecting option B. You're becoming a deferred member with a Sarah, an active member with Contra Costa County, and then you're linking them together, establishing reciprocity. Okay, then let's say that you find an even higher paying job in San Francisco County for paying $40 an hour. Well, you go get that job. You link that system. So now you got three linked together. Um, we're all going to use the $40, you know, the highest salary that you earn under any of those systems. And uh, you just need to leave your contributions on deposit with all of the systems that you're linking together. There can be no more than a six month gap between when you terminate this job and you start employment in the next job. Okay. So you, so if there's more, if it's a seven month gap, you can't establish reciprocity. Number three, you don't want to have more than 12 weeks of overlapping service. So that means that if you have a bunch of vacation on the books, let's say you have like 14 weeks of vacation on the books and you decide you're going to take a 14 week vacation at the end of your career here and go start a new job immediately, um, that you would have overlapping service and that would prevent you from establishing reciprocity. 12 weeks is kind of a lot. So um, we used to, it used to be zero weeks and now it's 12. So this is, it. you know, it's pretty easy to avoid. Just um, leave your job here, cash out your vacation, and then uh, go get the new job. And then you have to retire from all the systems on the same day uh, in order to keep reciprocity whole. And that's how you do reciprocity. Let me check the board here. Check the questions. Okay, do you use the highest salary for all the retirement systems to calculate the pension? Yes. So in the example I was giving, where you worked for you know, 10 years here, five years in Contra Costa County, two years over in San Francisco. When you go to retire from all of those systems on the same day, you submit a retirement application to each system. We're each going to do a retirement calculation. At Acera, we're going to use your 10 years here. Contra Costa County is going to use your five years there. San Francisco County would use your two years there. The age factor percentage would be based on whatever the age factor percentages are for each system. That could be different. And then, of course, the service credit will be what you earned in each system. So for a Sarah, we would use your highest salary from one of the other systems, the 10 years here and the age factor percentage here. And that would determine what your pension is from a Sarah. And then we would send you a check. Contra Costa County would send you a check. San Francisco County would send you a check. So that's how, that's how that would work in that example. Okay, there's a couple of other questions here real, that I can get to real fast. The half sick leave conversion, if you go straight into retirement, um, yes, tier four gets that also. Yep. Um, the best way to submit the beneficiary form, um, quick code, US mail, um, you can do either one of those. That's great. Um, email, I think you can attach it to and send it to info at acera.org. A more secure way to do it, because email isn't that secure, is you log into your account on our website. And there's an option there for uploading a document or a form. So you just take, you just scan in, you just scan in the beneficiary form and upload it. 
Um, I actually happen to be working on getting our beneficiary forms into DocuSign. So in the next few weeks, those will be available in DocuSign as well. And then you can just submit it through DocuSign. Okay, next question. If someone designates his or her child as a beneficiary, they receive their, their survivor allowance until their death. No. If you designate a minor child as for a continuance for that survivor allowance, they would get it until age 18 unless they maintain um, enrollment in an accredited school, at which point it could continue until age 22. And there's more details about that if you go to a serotonin slash death. Um, but for the minor children, it is not a lifetime allowance. Um, there's a question. I just set up my Acera on an account. Thanks for the reminder. Do I still have to complete a member enrollment form? Uh, that would be great. Uh, we are currently trying to figure out how to get more people to um, complete those. It's called the member enrollment questionnaire. If you go out to acera.org slash forms, um, you could, you'll find it there, member enrollment questionnaire. You can also go to acera.org slash MEQ, and it will take you right to the DocuSign um, form. So there's a question about the salary in my example. You're making $20 an hour to Sarah for 10 years. You go to Contra Costa County, you're making $30 an hour for two years, three years, whatever. You go to San Francisco County, you make $50 an hour over there. So you are correct. When we all go to calculate your retirement, we're going to use that $50 an hour figure at the other you know, at the, the highest salary that you earn under any of the systems for your 10 years of work at Acera in that example. And um, there's a question, can you designate a contingent beneficiary? Absolutely, that is on the form. Yep. There's a spot for contingent beneficiaries and contingent beneficiary is um, should, like you designate your spouse as a the primary beneficiary, for example, should you and your spouse pass away at the same time? Um, like there's an accident or something, you have a contingent beneficiary um, that then is established with the Sarah that we would know to pay immediately. So I showed you, so getting back to the slideshow, I showed you options A and B, deferring your retirement, establishing reciprocity, uh, should you terminate your employment with your employer and not retire immediately. Option C is taking a refund of your employee contributions and interest. If you should do that, and you're looking for a lump sum payment, like you wanna deposit that money in your bank account, you may lose a third of your money, a third of the total balance to taxes and penalties. Um, the penalties are if you are, I think, under age 59 and you're withdrawing it. To avoid the taxes and penalties, um, what you would want to do is roll it over into a pre-tax retirement account, like a 457B account or an IRA. Excuse me. My apologies. Or um, one of these listed here. Refunds can take a while, could take over 60 days to process. Um, so it's not an instantaneous thing. And what you're doing when you take a refund is you're waiving all your rights to a set of benefits. You're saying, I don't want access to the pension, lifetime pension. I don't want access to the healthcare benefits if I have at least 10 years of a service credit. No access to the death benefits. Cancel my membership. Please refund my money. That's basically what you're saying. And if he, this is actually this is not a great option if you're going if you're already ready to retire or if you will become ready to retire. Because remember, at the beginning of the um, presentation, I told you that if you retire from Acera and start trying that pension benefit, we're going to give you all this money back anyway, within the first three to five years of retirement through your pension payments. And then you're going to get a lifetime pension after that every month for the rest of your life. So in most cases, taking a refund is not a great deal. Um, but I'll let you, you know, we can advise you more on that if you should you leave and tell you what your options are. Okay, we have just enough time for this last um, topic before I turn it over to um, Jean Hilliard, who is our representative 
with the um, deferred compensation program. So I'm going to now revisit the slide that I showed you in the beginning of the presentation. This is a picture of your income at retirement, um, the, your sources of income after retirement, okay? Because like I said before, you stop working, your employer is going to stop paying you your salary because you're not working there anymore. So you're going to need some income to survive. So a lot of that could come from your ACERA monthly pension, um, depending on how much uh, you earn in your pension. Or if you have other pensions, you could kind of put that in that same category in the um, equation. If you will collect, if you're eligible to collect Social Security one day, which means that you have paid into the Social Security system for at least 10 years, um, and that's not 10 consecutive years, that's just 10 years over your lifetime, um, you will be eligible to collect uh, Social Security benefits um, starting at age 62. But if you wait, you could collect um, a higher payment um, should you wait. So you can add that into the equation. That will be part of your income that you're going to need to um, pay for your life after retirement. And then everything on top of that, everything else would be your personal savings and investments. And like I was saying earlier, financial planners will, will say that in order to maintain your standard of living, you'll need at least 70 to 80% of your salary that you were earning before retirement. You'll need at least that 70 to 80% of that income in retirement to maintain your standard of living so that it's even. So how do you get there? Okay. It's actually, you, you're actually in a really good position being a new employee or being in your mid-career because it means you have some time. You have some time to figure this out. You have time to kind of look at where you're at, what trajectory you're on, and uh, see if you might want to get in a, you know, slightly change your trajectory a little bit. And it's, it's not that complicated of a process, okay? Step one is you're going to want to go ahead and get some estimates, okay? So for your Sarah estimate, you're going to want to get a an Sarah estimate and a Social Security estimate, okay? Like I said, for your Sarah estimate, you go to our website, you log into your account, you use the benefit estimator, you end up with the PDF, you look at the unmodified option under the member monthly benefit, and you just take note of that number, and you can get out a scratch piece of paper. You're also going to want to... Um, you know, in this retirement scenario that you're doing, you're just going to want to think about what age you are in this retirement scenario, okay? In this particular example, this person's Sarah estimate would be about $2,200, and they'd be retiring at age 60, okay? So what, we're just seeing what happens right now. You know, this is far in the future. We don't know if we're going to retire at 62. Maybe we'll retire at 55. Maybe we'll retire at 65. You know, we have no idea. But 62 seems like a plausible you know, possible retirement age a little bit early. You know, let's see what happens if we if we do this estimate. It 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 seems like a, a decent age to shoot for. Okay, you know, it might be different for you, but you can fill in the blanks uh, based on your scenario. Okay, so then you're going to want to do the same thing for Social Security. You go out to the Social Security website. Um, you could go to ssa.gov/estimator, or you can just find the link for the estimator at ssa.gov. You'll find once you log into their site, they will provide you a custom social security estimate based on your particular situation. And it will look something like this. You'll see they'll give you three ages. And if you retire early at age 62, which is the first age that you're eligible, you'll get a certain dollar amount, 67 or 70. Um, they'll give you other dollar amounts, okay? In this example, we're kind of shooting for age 62. So let's see what happens if we stick with that. So it's about $1,700 a month at age 62. Okay, so we've completed step number one. We get some estimates. We've taken a little peek into the future. Um, so we've kind of filled in the blanks on these top two. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to see if how much more we might want to save that will get us up to the 70 to 80% of our salary. Now you can sit here and, I mean, you could do it on scratch paper and do this equation, but I, I recommend using technology because it will take into account um, like interest and compound interest and all that. So 
I recommend using a retirement calculator. If you Google retirement calculator, you'll find a myriad of them. You might find like 20 or 30 of them. Uh, we have some links out to some of those out on our retirement planning page. Again, it's a sarah.org slash planning. Um, some examples are the Vanguard calculator. Um, there's also the Prudential retirement calculator. I think I need to change the slide because it's not Prudential anymore. Um, it's uh, the, the new deferred compensation provider and my brain is blanking on that, but Gene Hilliard will tell you what it is in just a second. Um, this is a calculator inside your deferred compensation account and it will help you arrive at this number uh, pretty easily. You know, there's some other ones there. What I'm gonna show you is the Vanguard calculator. It's just an example of one of these. Um, and just, just to show you how it works to fill in that gap of like how much additional you might wanna save. So again, we're at acera.org slash planning, or you go to acera.org, you go under members, you go to planning your future retirement income, scroll down to step four, calculating how much to save. Click on the link for the Vanguard calculator. If you forget how to do this, there's actually a little link to a video with instructions here. So what I'm going to do is do this retirement scenario with the hope that this will tell me how much additional I might want to start saving now. So let me put in a scenario. Let's say that you're age 30, shooting for age 62. So I'm 30 years old currently in this hypothetical situation. I'm going to retire at age 62. Let's say my salary is $70,000 per year. So you put in your annual salary, whatever it is. This part I'm gonna leave blank, okay? Cause um, for right now, you can, if you already do save a certain amount, you can go ahead and put that in. Like, let's say that you already save $1,000 a year. You can go ahead and put that in right now, okay? Let's say that you save zero. That's perfectly fine, don't worry. If you don't save anything extra toward retirement right now, like don't stress out about it because we're just going to paint a little picture here and maybe it will help you figure out how much you might want to save. And if you've saved this, if you've saved some already, you could put that in here in this field, or if you've saved zero, you just leave it blank. Now this right here is the income replacement amount. So I'm going to be conservative and I'm going to say we're going to need 80% income replacement. This is that 70 to 80% income replacement number, that's what you're putting in here, which, which, in, which amount of income replacement you're targeting, whether it's 70 or 80 or 90, Gene Hilliard's going to try to get you to target 100, um, which, and he's going to be in here shortly talking about how you can get aimed in, in, in that trajectory. Okay, this number right here, this is an expected annual return, and this is based on where you're thinking about putting your additional savings. Presumably, you may want to put it in some place that could earn interest, like in your 457B account, in a uh, very diverse array of investments that over the long term will probably help you earn interest in the neighborhood of 5 to 7%, or it could be even more. Um, at Acera, we assume 7%. I'm just going to put in here 6%, just to be kind of conservative. Um, and then... The best calculators, the most helpful ones for you all, because you have a pension, will let you put in a pension amount. So the example that we were doing was $2,200, your Sarah monthly pension, and the Social Security was about $1,700. So these are, this is where you're putting in the amount that Sarah will pay you per month and where Social Security will pay you per month. Then you hit calculate. What you're seeing now is a graph of the right bar is telling you how much the calculator thinks you will need per month in retirement to um, maintain your standard of living um, where you're targeting 80% income replacement, okay? What you see over here on the left side is how much you may actually have based on the numbers we plugged into the calculator. And you can see that there's a gap. The idea here is to get these, make these even, okay? The um, the green, the dark green is representing your social security income. The light green is representing your pension benefit. And there's no retirement savings in here filling in the gap yet because we haven't put in any um, into the calculator yet. 
So I'm going to go back up to the calculator and I'm going to see what happens if I were to save $400 a year, which would be about 0.6% of my annual income for retirement. And I'm going to hit recalculate. Okay, it didn't move much. I'm going to see what happens if I put in $6,000 a year of savings, which is about 8% of my income in this example. Okay, now I'm saving way too much. If I'm targeting exactly 80%. So let me go down to 4,000. It's almost there. Let's see what happens if I do 4,400. Okay, now it's about even. So what the calculator is telling me is if I'm 30 years old and I'm planning to retire at age 62, and this is my current salary, if I save $4,400 per year of my $70,000 salary in a place that is likely to achieve me 6% um, interest, by the time I get to age 62, I will have achieved 80% income replacement. That means that my income based on my Sarah pension, my social security and my retirement savings will be enough to live on to maintain my standard of living. So that's what this is telling me. Now, $4,400 a year, it sounds like a lot. Let's see what happens if we split it up over 26 pay periods. It's $169 per pay period, okay? So if you could, I mean, in this scenario, if this person could find an extra $169, $100, $80, that would get them pointed in a trajectory. I mean, if $169 would get you pointed at exactly 80%, but it, maybe you don't have that much. You, you can't find that much extra. So maybe you just get pointed in a direction, like maybe I have $40 that I can save per pay period in my 457B plan. Well, that would get you pointed in a direction. It might not be at 80%, but maybe you come back six months later, a year later, do the calculator again. You can save a little more. Or maybe you can save like the full amount that it's, that it's telling you that's going to get you to 80% at this point, and you're pointed at 80%, but you come back a year later, you do the calculator again, and you find, oh, now I'm pointed at 70%. I, I better put more in. Or you find that you're pointed at 90%, and um, you don't have to save as much, maybe, and maybe you have some short-term bills that it would be nice to pay. So you can you can keep readjusting. That's kind of the bottom line here that I'm that I'm telling you is at this point you're not going to be able to save an additional amount that will help you achieve exactly eighty percent income replacement by the time you retire, but you can get pointed in that direction because there are some years. Since you're a new employee or you're in your mid-career, there are some years between now and when you retire. And if you start now, if you just get pointed in that direction, you could start with as little as $20 per month in the 457B plan. Um, and you just keep readjusting over time. Come back six months later, come back a year later, do the calculator again and readjust. You will find that by the time you get to retirement, you will have achieved um, the income replacement that you need to maintain your standard of living. So that's kind of my pitch uh, for that. And I'm running a little, a little behind. So I'm going to go ahead and fast forward through these slides so I can turn it over to Gene because he's really the financial expert here. This is just kind of my you know, base level pitch on getting you started. I think it's just a good idea to get started um, with the additional retirement savings, you know, even if it's $20 per pay period. Um, it is a good, good thing to do to be cautious because I was, I was giving you a little pitch for saving your money somewhere that you can earn potential interest. Um, the, generally, the higher the potential to earn interest, the higher the financial risk. So definitely research where you're putting your money. The 457B account is a great place because it's professionally managed by people that the county or your employer has contracted specifically to manage those accounts. Um, to keep them low risk or as low as of a risk as possible. And um, otherwise, 
if you're keeping your money in some other place, uh, do research. And when I do say do research, it's actually not that hard. There's websites out there, especially NerdWallet and Investopedia, that really make it easy to, they really explain financial and investment concepts very easily. Like if you're curious about high interest savings accounts, for example, you type in high interest savings accounts, nerd wallet. Or if you're wondering what CDs do or what are available, you type in CDs, nerd wallet. And um, it will give you like a nice uh, primer on what that financial instrument is, what the risks are, like how to, how to get the, the best, um, you know, find the ones with the best interest and so on and so forth. Um, so that, so when I say do research, it's actually not, not that complicated. And when I, when I keep telling you, it's not that complicated, I'm really projecting upon you because I, my initial uh, feeling before exploring these topics was that this stuff was like complicated and I wanted to put it off for later. What I find is that when you actually like start reading these articles, it's, it's pretty easy. You all are very intelligent and you're very skilled at the jobs that you do for the public in Alameda County. And um, I think that you'll find once you uh, get your feet wet in this area, it's actually not that complicated. And um, one of the, and so there's some more slides here that you can go through on your own. If you need help, um, you can get help from the deferred compensation program. Like you can talk to them as much as you want. They will give you advice um, on uh, how to maximize your retirement. Um, so I think I'll probably just go ahead and turn it over to Gene. One, one more thing that I want to mention, though, is I kind of fast forwarded through that last part because I want to make sure that you get as much time as possible um, with Gene because he's the real financial expert. But that planning page is sarah.org slash planning. If you want to take it slow and go step by step and like really read about the process that I was just taking you through, um, it's all laid out here on this page. And you can, it'll take you, you know, anywhere between five minutes and, you know, 30 minutes or an hour maybe to go through each of the steps, um, getting the ACERA estimate, getting, uh, um, understanding the future retirement income, getting the social security estimate, doing the calculators, and then, um, you know, reading about places where you can park your money once you've determined how much additional to save. And then um, there's more information about the 457B account in there. So that's where I recommend uh, going to if you want to start uh, exploring this topic more. There, we have a bunch of links out to uh, further resources. There's kind of some extra credit resources down here. Um, so yeah, that's what I recommend. Okay, so yeah, Empower is the name. So thank you for, thank you all for reminding me. I see lots of reminders <laughs> what the name is. Okay, so at this point, um, any other of the questions about a Sarah, I'm gonna go ahead and save for after the deferred compensation presentation because I want you to um, get more time with uh, more with Jean. Um, there is a question, when will this be offered again? Uh, we're going to offer another one in, where are we at? August, um, I think in, it's quarterly. So September, October, November. Um, there is a, there, we actually might be doing another one in September because both of the ones for this week filled up. So I'm going to send out more information about that. Um, if you want to go ahead and go to the original email that you received and click on the waitlist link, um, you can get on the waitlist for that September uh, new employee mid-career webinar. Otherwise, you can just go out to our website, go to acerra.org slash seminars, and you can sign up for the new ones in November. Okay, so with that... Um, I'm going to turn it over to Gene Hilliard. Gene, are you there? I am here, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Perfect. So stop my share. Okay. Let's show, let's see, from the beginning. I'm, I'm looking good on my end. In terms of the first slide. Okay, yep. Okay. Important information. I'm not seeing any notes. Yep. 
Yep. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, let's go ahead away. and get let's go ahead and get started. Well, uh, good good morning, or is it afternoon? No, it's still morning. Good morning. My name is Gene Hilliard. I'm Vice President, Financial Advisor of Emerge Financial Group. We're a financial services company in Oakland. We help our clients with uh, financial planning. We do taxes. We do accounting for small businesses. A little bit about my background for those who don't know. I, I was hired, my firm was hired roughly 14 years ago by, at the time, Prudential, which, as you guys had mentioned to Mike, is now Empower. So we were hired roughly 14 years ago to help Alameda County participants with uh, retirement planning and also offer uh, investment guidance uh, in terms of deferred comp. Uh, my background, I've been been in the business roughly 20 years, helping my clients create wealth and maintain that wealth throughout their lifetime. And I'm also a retirement counselor. And my goal as a retirement counselor is to help each and every one of you maintain your current lifestyle in retirement. What does that mean? Well, I'm, I want you to get to 100%. And I think Mike talked about that. Yes, most financial planners say you don't need 100%. 70 to 80 is sufficient. But hey, why not? Let's shoot for 100. And if we need to settle for less, so be it. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, uh, it was April of 2022 that Prudential announced that they were selling the Empower or selling their retirement business to Empower, which, by the way, it's an excellent company. Um, this is all of what they do. I mean, Prudential dabbled a lot. They started off as more of an insurance company. OK, but Empower, that's all they've ever done was pretty much retirement. So you're in good hands. Uh, there's still going to be some links that say Prudential on them. So be cognizant of that. But in the not too distant future, everything is going to switch over to Empower. But right now, there's a little bit of Empower, a little bit of Prudential here and there. OK, but what we encourage folks to do now is uh, you know, every as I mentioned, everything's pretty much staying the same. But if in terms of going to websites to view your account, if you have a deferred comp, we'd rather you, you know, ditch the other link and just go to Alameda County DCP.com, right? Phone numbers don't change either. We still have that WOW 457B number. So you can still call that hit one if you want to speak with someone at Empower, hit two if you want to hit speak with someone at the treasurer's office. That's Darnell, Aaron, or, or Hank, um, and hit three if you want to schedule an appointment with myself uh, or with, uh, with Mark Tomei or with Jason Brunner, okay? So phone numbers, there's the website. Um, we encourage everyone also keep your information up to date. Um, I would like for folks, if Empower has your work email address in the system, I would encourage that you switch that over to personal. Uh, and the reason why I say that is say, for example, you leave the county and we need to get a hold of you. Your county email is not going to work. Right. So, but if you keep your county email, that's fine. But just know if we need, if we need to get a hold of you and you leave the county, then it's going to be tough. We're going to have to send you snail mail for you to get information. So keep your information up to date. Uh, Let's get to, let's talk about the importance of deferred comp. As I mentioned before, my goal is to help you to get to 100% of your salary. You're in a very, very good position, a good space in terms of working with Alameda County. Best case scenario, you're probably looking at getting at least 50% of your salary. So go on that, uh, go to acera.org, use that calculator to see where you stand in terms of your pension. But in many cases, you spend 40 years, 30 years with the county, you're looking at maybe half your salary. You throw in Social Security, you're probably short. That's where deferred comp comes in. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of it. Of it. And I'll try to keep it short, maybe with, uh, I'll try to keep it to like 30 minutes, because I know you guys might be a little, a little tired from um, being on the phone since nine o'clock. So what does Empower do? Uh, how, do, how does Empower fit into the picture where we, we help you figure out the whole retirement planning process, help you determine how much money you need, help you determine uh, how much you should contribute, 
help you determine how you should invest your money. And then lastly, how do you responsibly spend the money down in retirement? So that's pretty much our goal uh, through Empower. My goal with Emerge Financial Group is to assist with that process. Treasurer's office is also part of that process is to help, help you navigate. Uh, we were pretty much hired, as I mentioned, 14 years ago, because the county just likes to see people on the ground, people that understand the community. It can be a challenge for someone who's, you know, with Empower coming from New Jersey in their community. They may or may not understand the, the nuance of Alameda County. So it's important to have some guys and gals that work within the county that understand the people. So that's pretty much why uh, it was important for me to get involved uh, with deferred college. Okay, what will your retirement look like, right? That's extremely important. Now, most of you are either new employees or mid-career. You're probably 20, 30 years away from retirement. So it's kind of hard to get your arms around what retirement will look like so far in advance, but give it a shot. What are you going to be doing? Most people talk about traveling. I'm going to travel here, there, everywhere. You know, I like to ask, well, where are you going? Because that will determine how much you're going to need, right? Or do you want to, you know, go back and forth between vacation homes? What's, you know, are you going to spend more time with friends and family? I know a lot of folks want to do that since we came out of the, uh, COVID situation, and we missed out on time spending with family, so we're making up for lost time. So try to envision what your retirement is going to look like. Where are you going to be? Are you going to stay in the Bay Area? Or are you going to move out of the country? Those are some things you want to at least start thinking about. Um, how much do you need to retire? We talked about that earlier. Most, most folks, financial planners, say 70 to 90. Uh, some people only need 60. Some people only need 50. That's an even better position. It, it all depends on your situation. Many of us come from humble beginnings. We don't spend a whole lot of money, even while we're working. So maybe 50% of your salary will do the trick, right? Some of you may be thinking, well, how in the world can anyone survive off of 70, 80, 90%? Don't they need 100 Right. But keep in mind that there are a lot of costs that go away in retirement. For example, do you have to continue to pay into a SARA when you retire? The answer is no. So there is a bill that goes away in retirement. Number two, do you have to continue to pay into Social Security if your job requires that you pay into Social Security? That goes away. Right. So there are some costs that go away in retirement. So you don't need 100 percent. So that's why that percentage goes down. But I still say, hey, more is, more is better. Shoot for 100, 100% and let's settle for 70 or 80 or 90. Where will your income come from? Uh, Mike did an excellent job of kind of spelling this out. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here, but Social Security, you're, if, you're, if you pay into Social Security, if you're a sheriff deputy, uh, many of those folks don't pay into Social Security. So their Social Security is gonna be minimal if anything, right? So social security could be a part of your income strategy. Uh, pensions through a Sarah, you're definitely gonna have a pension. How much remains to be seen? Retirement plans, that's deferred comp. Maybe you have an IRA, 401k at different institutions with previous employers, right? Income from other assets. Maybe you have, you inherited some property that's generating positive cash flow that you're gonna be able to access in retirement. And then income from savings. I encourage or income from earnings. I encourage folks, believe it or not, it's okay to work in retirement. I would rather you work in retirement. You want to stay sharp. You know, you don't want to stay stagnant. Body in motion stays in motion. So uh, what I find unacceptable is having to work in retirement, but doing a little work part-time that you enjoy volunteering, et cetera, there's nothing wrong with that. Make a few extra bucks. Okay, but these are this is where your income is going to come from. Uh, for those of you who are not in the plan, you're re it's important to recognize that it's easy. Money comes out of your paycheck. Every paycheck, money comes out of your paycheck, and it goes into your deferred compensation plan. 
You can set it up where money is going in, uh, a specific dollar amount goes in per paycheck or a percent of your salary goes in, uh, comes out of your paycheck and goes into deferred comp. Um, I prefer that you use a percent of your salary, right? And I'm sure some of you also may be thinking, well, how much is appropriate to put into deferred comp uh, in terms of a percent or dollar amount? I, you know, I try to encourage folks at least shoot for 10%. Shoot for 10% of your salary, right? If you need to scale that back, that's fine. Do five. Start somewhere and build on that. Uh, over time. Uh, earlier, I mentioned I prefer a percent of your salary, and it's uh, and this is the reason why. For example, you know, say you get a raise, you're doing I don't know five hundred dollars a paycheck, and you get a raise, and you want to do six hundred. You have to go back into the system and to change it to six hundred, versus if you use a percent of your salary, there's nothing you need to do because as your paycheck rises that 5% or 10% is gonna rise right along with it. So it automatically increases your contribution into deferred common. So that's part of the reason why I prefer that you go with a percent of your salary versus a dollar amount, okay? Here's some of the highlights of deferred comp. Uh, deferred comp helps bridge the gap between social security and ACERA, makes total sense. Money comes directly out of your paycheck. We talked about that. You can invest in a tax deferred way, pre-tax or Roth, that's after tax. There's a variety of investments, roughly 15 investments. I'll talk a little bit about that later. 14, 15 different types of investments. If you wanna roll money into the plan, you can from previous employers. You have flexible distribution options, meaning you know, if you wanna take it all out of deferred comp when you retire, knock yourself out, or if you wanna take $500 a month until the account's depleted, completely up to you. It's your money, completely flexible. And then there's catch-up contributions where you can do more. Uh, you can do 30,000 if you're 50 and over. You can do roughly $45,000 a year with using the three-year catch-up. I'll briefly touch on that. And then there's loans that are available. So, but let's talk about pre-tax. If you believe you're going to be in a lower tax bracket when you retire, then the pre-tax version of deferred comp works. Right, you're putting money into the account, reduces your taxable income, you pay taxes later uh, in a lower tax bracket than you are now, okay? But if you believe you're going to be in a higher tax bracket when you retire, then maybe the Roth version of deferred comp works better for you. Now, it's not a Roth IRA, it's a Roth 457B. And how that works, you're putting money in, you're not getting a tax break, but the money grows tax-free. So you have access to your Roth deferred comp money tax-free provided that you qualify, all right? So when you put those two side by side, pre-tax versus Roth, effects of your paycheck, hey, uh, your paycheck, uh, your the dollar amount that you contribute or the percent of your salary that you contribute is not dollar for dollar. So for example, if you're putting $100 a paycheck away, your paycheck's gonna change by like 75 bucks if you invest pre-tax. You invest Roth, you put $100 out of your paycheck, your paycheck's gonna change by roughly $100, right? Pre-tax, uh, when you take money out in terms of distribution, it's ordinary income. So you're gonna have to pay taxes. Versus the Roth, as I mentioned before, there's no taxes on the disbursement, provided that you qualify. How do you qualify? You got to be at least 59 and a half. The account's been open for five years. Then you have access, access to your Roth deferred comp money tax-free. Kind of nice. Okay. Here are the, the maximums. If you're under 50, you can put away $22,500. That's 2023. For this year, you can put away $22,500. If you're 50 and over, you can put away an additional 7,500 bucks bringing your total to $30,000 a year. So you can, so if you're 50 and over, you have some extra money, maybe you wanna retire sooner than later, let's sacrifice today, hey, let's bump our contributions up to the $30,000 max, why not? And then as I mentioned, you can put away, if you're roughly, the soonest you can participate in the three-year catch-up is 54 and a half. Maybe you have some money sitting in credit union, not earning anything. 
and you want to get more bang for your buck, you can indirectly move that money from the credit union into deferred comp. Now, you can't just write a check and put it in there. It has to be payroll deductions. So you'd have to trick the system. So you tell me, all right, Gene, I want you to take, all right, take half my paycheck, put it in deferred comp. And then when you get paid, you're short. All right, where am I going to get the money to pay my bills? I'm short half my paycheck. Well, you can go to the credit union or go to your local bank where you have money sitting and just live off of that. And then once your money is dwindled down to a number you feel comfortable with, then you just go back to me and say, Gene, all right, now I want you to switch it back to 500 bucks a paycheck. Okay, so that's how you can indirectly move money from the outside going into the inside of deferred comp. Okay, if there's any 25 years old, 25 year olds on the line or on this uh, presentation. Here's an example, person's 25, and I'm not saying this is necessarily applies to you, um, but I'm this person is contributing 300 bucks a month to help uh, supplement their retirement. They plan on retiring at age 65. Assuming uh, a 6% rate of return, you're at 575,000. But here's a person who's 35. Maybe they heard my presentation when they were 25, they were kind of hard headed, or maybe they just flat out weren't making a whole heck of a lot of money, but they've gotten a couple of raises. They understand the importance. So they're contributing to deferred comp. Now, because they waited, it's gonna cost you a little bit more. So instead of 300, we're gonna go to $500 a month. This person is going to retire at age 65 as well. So in 30 years, you're looking at 490. And here's an example of a person who's 45, contributing to deferred comp for 20 years. At age 65, they retire with 455,000. So point of this slide, hey, yes, we want you to start as soon as possible to take full advantage of compound interest. But all is not lost if you're waiting later in life to save towards retirement because you can still amass a pretty significant amount of money to help supplement your retirement. The importance here is just, we need you to get started as soon as possible. Some of you may have gotten posts by Alameda County. Maybe you came from San Francisco. Maybe you came from San Joaquin, Napa, Contra Costa, and you have a dormant 457B plan account. You can roll that money over, or maybe you have a 401k, 403b, you used to work for a nonprofit, or maybe you were a teacher and you got money over there and you want to consolidate, you want to simplify your life. Well, you can do that. Just talk to me. I'll explain to you the uh, what the process is and you can roll money into deferred comp from the outside. Once you do retire, you, as I mentioned earlier, there's flexible distribution options. There was a time, I think it was probably I don't know, 30 years ago, where you once you retired, you had to tell at the time Prudential uh, what your intentions were, how much you wanted per month, and that can never change. So uh, there are a lot of folks with the county that seem to be a little irritated with that. They should have more flexibility. So they changed the rules. So you can now do what you want with your money. You know, you want to take out a monthly amount until the account's exhausted, you can. You want to ask for money when you need it, you can. The other important thing is if you by chance decide you want to retire before you're 59 and a half, you don't have to worry about a penalty, right? I'm sure you've probably heard about IRAs and 403Bs and 401Ks that there's a pen penalty attached to withdrawal. So you pay taxes and a penalty. That does not apply to deferred comp. Tax rules, tax code is a little bit different with a 457B, okay? You guys are new, mid-career, you're, you're not thinking about, I, I would hope, distribution options. But if you happen to leave the county, maybe you want to take a sabbatical, you do have access to your money without penalty, regardless of your age. If you're ever in a pinch, you need access to your, your cash, be responsible. You can borrow against your deferred comp. What's the parameters on that? Well, you can borrow 50% or $50,000 whichever is less, that's 50%, $50,000, whichever is less, you're lending money to yourself, okay? You're lending money back to yourself with interest, okay? So uh, if you're debating on whether or not to, you know, I don't know, refinance or get a personal loan, this might be a good option. 
and you pay that back through payroll deductions with interest based upon whatever the prime rate is, and it goes back into your account. So it's not like interest goes to Empower or to Jeans Company. No, interest goes back to you into your account. So, but again, be responsible, use that sparingly, only use it in the case of an emergency. Uh, there are roughly uh, 15, 14 investments in deferred comp. So if you're the type of person that's a, you know, a do-it-yourselfer, you know, then I would encourage you do your homework. Log on to Alameda County, dcp.com, click on investment options, do the research, and then act accordingly. Create your own diversified portfolio. It's up to you. There's index funds in there. There's socially responsible investments. If you're not a risk taker, there's the Alameda County, um, what is it called? Stable value fund pays roughly 2%. So you're not going to make a ton of money on it, but hey, there's no risk. You know, but if you want to create a diversified portfolio of small cap companies, medium sized companies, large international bonds, you can do that. OK, a uh, lot of folks who are do it yourselfers, uh, do it myself. They create a portfolio and they reach out to me and say, Gene, this is what I'm thinking. You see any landmines here so we can craft an investment strategy together. Okay, so here are the names of the different funds, the Fidelity 500 index fund, that's an index fund. People tend to go with index funds because they're inexpensive, uh, relatively cheap, okay? Uh, where is PAX? Oh, Impact Sustainable, that's the socially responsible investment. Then you have Alameda County Stable Value at the top left, that's the non-risk. So don't let your colleagues tell you that, oh, you don't wanna invest in deferred comp, it's risky. It can be, but if you don't want to carry any risk, you don't have to worry about it. Just go with the Alameda County Stable Value Fund. Many of you are experts at what you do and you need some help. So that's why we have this great tool. It's an award-winning tool called Goldmaker, right? You tell us what your investor style is, conservative, moderate, aggressive. You tell us when you anticipate retiring and the system will do the rest, okay? So here's, for example, a person who's, a moderate investor. This is what a gold maker portfolio would look like, right? You have a mix of stable value, fixed income, large cap, small cap, international. There's also a great tool included in gold maker that's called rebalancing, right? What is that? Well, let's say hypothetically, uh, gold maker said that you should have roughly 80% of your money in stocks, 20% and more conservative, fixed income, stable value. And over time, that mix kind of gets out of, out of whack. Say the market does extremely well and your 80-20 portfolio turns into 90-10. Well, 90% of your money in the stocks is too risky for you. So how do we get back to the appropriate amount of risk? We do what is called a rebalance, right? So you, you sell 10% of your stocks and then you buy 10% back in a stable value to get you back to that 80-20. And that happens all behind the scenes. It happens once a quarter, if that's the way you set it up, or it happens once a year, okay? So that's automatic rebalancing. Another great tool that's associated with Goldmaker is age adjustment. So it, it automatically gets more conservative as you get closer and closer to retirement, right? What is conservative? So hypothetically, conservative is stable value. More goes into stable value as you get closer to retirement. So I'd like to direct your attention to the, the pie chart on the far left where it's 16 plus years to retirement. And then you have that blue stable value. So pay attention to that blue. And you'll notice as you navigate to 11 to 15, to six to 10, to zero to five, that blue area gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's pretty much how it works. The account is getting more and more conservative. We're putting more money in safekeeping, something safe, because you don't have time on your side to recoup any losses. So that's, uh, that is called uh, age adjustment, and that's gold maker. Okay. Fees and expenses. Let's talk about that. Um, many folks probably on this call have probably heard or someone has told them, hey, it's free. Alameda County's deferred comp plan is free. And I'm here to tell you that it has never been free, right? It has never been free. 
there's always a, a cost associated with it, even way back when. It just wasn't as transparent as it should be. So for example, you have a mutual fund that you've invested, the Alameda County large cap growth fund, I'm just making that up. And let's say hypothetically, there is an expense ratio of 1%, right? And the rate of return on that Alameda County large cap growth fund hypothetically was 10%, all right? And you, but you wanna confirm it. One day you're up late at night, you can't sleep, you have insomnia, you wanna confirm that, all right, Gene said I should be getting 10% rate of return on this fund. I wanna confirm that he's accurate. So you punch the numbers and then lo and behold, you see, wait a minute, my rate of return is only 9%. So you reach out to me, you know, you're a little irritated. Gene, you said this was 10%, but I'm only seeing 9%. Where is the difference? Well, that difference is that expense ratio of that fund. It's a fund, you know, it's a charge that the manager who's buying and selling stock on your behalf pulls from you, right? And it's not as transparent. You didn't see it. It comes from your rate of return or it, it increases your negative rate of return because you're paying extra. Now, the, the Alameda County Treasurer felt that, hey, that's not transparent. We need, participants should see what they're paying. So they changed the structure, I think it was about a year ago, where uh, exactly 0.20% of your portfolio is pulled out of your deferred comp to pay for the plan. So you see it, it's clear as day. Okay, so I just wanna make sure everyone's clear or maybe you've had questions regarding that fee. It's like it came out of the blue, but it did, you know, this is, it was a change from, I think it was the end of last year, somewhere in there, or maybe before that, but that comes out. So just know that at a minimum, you're looking at 0.20%. But there are up some other mutual funds in the plan that um, where they charge you a little bit more. And it's still within that expense ratio example I talked about. So if you pick a fund where there's active investing, that means you're, you've hired a manager, unbeknownst to you, you've hired a manager that's buying stock on your behalf. He or she wants to get paid. So it comes out of that expense ratio, that's active investing. But if you wanna reduce that expense ratio fee, then maybe passive investing makes more sense to you. Passive investing equals index funds. So remember that, what was it? The Fidelity 500 index fund? That is a passive investment strategy. You're getting an index and that's it. And I believe that fee on that is like 0.01%. So it's very cheap, okay? So I just wanted to outline and explain fees a little bit. And if you have any other questions, we can either do this, do that offline, schedule an appointment with me, or if we have time, we can talk about it at the end of this presentation. All right, this is a duplicate slide, so just ignore that. What is next? Well, um, make sure you go on to acera.org, get an estimate in terms of what you anticipate uh, receiving uh, from your pension. Very important if you haven't already. Enroll, log on to alamedacountydcp.com, click on the enroll in the plan. Don't click on register because you don't have an account yet. You wanna click on enroll, enroll in the plan. If you wanna increase, go to the same website and you see where it says, uh, increase your contribution, click on that link and then put in the percent of your salary that you wanna contribute. But enroll in the plan, once you start the process of enrollment, don't stop because you're gonna get distracted and it could be a year before you sign up and you've missed out on some, some rates of return. So. Once you start this process, continue where people stop and get concerned or you know, uh, want to schedule an appointment or talk to somebody is when you get to the beneficiaries. Uh, man, I don't have my wife's or daughter's social security number, so I'm going to stop. No, I don't do that. Put the person's name, skip the social security number. We'll get that later. The other area where people get a little tripped up is the uh, investments. Oh, maybe I should have a meeting with Gene first or talk to my current financial advisor before I pick the investments. Don't do that either. Just choose Goldmaker with age adjustment. Just start there. 
gold maker with age adjustment, just choose I'm a moderate investor, I'm gonna retire at 65, call it a day. The first contribution takes place in a month. So you have time to alter your investment strategy if necessary, but we wanna make sure you get signed up, okay? Once you've already uh, contributed to the plan and you have money, money has already come out of your paycheck, then you wanna to go to Alameda County DCP, click on register to create a user ID and password so you can view your account, see your rates of return, move money around if you choose, whatever. Uh, there's a nice little tool called the Retirement Income Calculator, and I think Mike touched on that a little bit. Uh, he was illustrating, uh, I think it was Van Vanguard's website. That's a great tool too, but just know that uh, Empower has a tool. It's called the Retirement Income Calculator. You log in and you put in what you anticipate from, so from Social Security, what you anticipate from ACERA. It already knows how much you have in deferred comp and how much you're contributing. Hit a button, it'll tell you if you're in good shape or not and what you need to do to fix a problem if there's a problem, okay? Three fantastic financial consultants here to help you. You have Mark Tomei on the left, Jason Brumman on the right, myself in the middle. To get a hold of us, here's the number, 855-969-4572. Uh, you can also log online, same website, click on personalized guidance to schedule an appointment with me. So that'll work too. If you wanna bypass all of this 855 number, the website, you can feel free to call my office directly at 510-562-6355. You can email me at G underscore Hilliard, H-I-L-L-I-A-R-D, at emergefinancial.com, okay? So uh, with that, I, I just wanna leave you with, retirement will be here before you know it. Uh, it's extremely important for you to start as soon as you can. Uh, the last thing I want to happen to you is that you're 65, you figure I'm 65, it's time to retire. And you go see Mike and say, Mike, I'm ready to retire. Give me my estimate of what I should anticipate receiving from a Sarah. And then you find out that's not nearly enough to sustain your lifestyle. And then you end up having to go back to work and maybe work until you're 70, 75, right? So you wanna get ahead of these things as much as possible and put away money as quickly as you can to give you more options. Maybe you wanna retire at 60 instead of 65, or maybe 55 instead of 60. Money is power. Money gives you the opportunity to, um, uh, to make choices, to control your destiny. So I, I would encourage you, if you're not in deferred comp, sign up. If you're contributing to deferred comp, increase your contributions and just let us know if you need some help with anything, okay? So with that, uh, I'd love to entertain questions.